Okay, we are now live streaming. So. And this is a new thing on Zoom. They tell us when they're recording. Um, okay. So we are uh, just near the end. For those who've just joined us from outside, we're just uh, near the end of a, a meet and greet session that we've been having informally with our new district manager, Michelle Booker, and with our new board members. And um, we, I think, Barbara, we're not going to, we should not start our, um, our agenda until 6.30, which is the official time we start. Um, but um, we've been joined by a number of people who are going to be panelists for the first item. I saw Nate Grove on our list. And is Nate as a panelist? He should be, I think. Um, yes. Some other people from um, the, the Boat Basin Project, I think, are on as panelists, are they? Sorry, be. I can't hear you. I don't know if anybody else has the problem. It may be my computer tonight or something. Oh, Barbara, because I put up the volume and I'm going to be pretty close. Yeah. And I'm also sitting on a pillow, so I'll be more visible tonight. Um, so, um, oh, Barbara, we need to recruit somebody if we have a volunteer uh, among our committee members to do the minutes tonight before we go into our meeting. We are missing several of our committee members still. I don't know whether they're going to be joining us at 630 or not. Um, the only committee members we have who are candidates here are Susan, who's the host, and um, you and I, and um, Ken. And so far, we don't know whether we'll have the other three, any of the other three members. So how are we going to do the minutes, guys? Well, um, I did them in March. Yes, you did. Uh, so if I were you, I would wait to see who shows up by 6.30. And, okay. Um, also, I, I don't want to utter the Q word, but I'm not sure we, we, we have that. <laughs> Ah, no, don't utter the Q word. No, 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 no Q word. No. Yeah, I'm, I'm in charge of uh, the bylaws task force. I'll say that we don't have a quorum yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, nope. we don't need a quorum to start the meeting. We just no. need to do something if we, and that will be quite a while from now if, if we do. So, um, and we will start at 630 no matter who we have. Um, in the meantime, though, I think we can say welcome to Matt Genrich, who is the manager of the parks in our district um, for the parks department other than the central and riverside and matt joins us typically every one of our committee meetings so welcome matt and let's just well, hello hi matt let's just look is, is jeff martin here who does riverside park i don't see him on our list right now um i know he'll he'll be on tonight so maybe he just hasn't got on yeah, got on sure. Sure. Barbara, what are we going to do? We got a couple minutes before 6.30. Did we talk about the minutes? What are we, we going to do with those? We just talked about it. Ken suggested we wait and see whether any right, okay. Sorry, I'm, I, like I said, I'm having trouble hearing you. Sorry. Oh, dear. I'll try to talk louder. I, I put the volume up on my computer. I thought that might make a I difference. Don't know. It, may be, it may be my computer. Yeah. Possible. Okay. Um, let's see. We don't have any other new members of the board who've joined us. Is that right? Daniela Alvarado is with us. Oh, is Daniela a new member? I am. Hi, how are you? Oh, I, you know, that is sounding familiar. Oh, so great. Daniela, for just a couple minutes, um, while we're finishing our meet and greet and waiting to start our full agenda, sure. you want to tell us a couple minutes about you and if you have any fast questions for us. It's great to have yeah. you. Yeah. Excited to join in um, about myself. I've been living in New York City for 13 years now, and uh, I've been on the Upper West Side for the most of for most of that time. I think all but like a year. Um, it's been great. I really like it here. Um, I'm excited about the parks, uh, the parks committee also in particular because I've been a runner for a lot of the time that I've lived in New York City um, and spent a lot of time in Central Park and in 
uh, Riverside Park. So I like to joke that I know every rock and every bump um, mm. and every like little hole uh, in the park. Um, yeah, I'm, other than that, I'm a real estate lawyer. I work at a firm uh, in Midtown that's based in New Jersey. Um, I do a lot of like acquisitions, dispositions, financing, uh, kind of boring stuff like that. Uh, but it's all good. I've been doing that for about how long now? Seven years, eight years, time flies. Um, and yeah, overall, I'm excited to get more involved um, in my community. Um, in the past, I've volunteered with the 69th Street Block Association, which is where I lived for a while. Now I live one block over and, or one block south and two blocks over on Amsterdam. Um, and, you know, I like being part of the neighborhood. So happy to be on board. Great. Well, welcome. Thank welcome. you. Happy to have you. Do you have any particular fast questions for us, Daniela, before we start our agenda? Um, I'm sure they will come up. <laughs> okay. I took a quick look we're at still, the we're still, in, we're still in meet and greet for another minute or so, and then yeah. we'll go into our agenda. Yeah. So this is an no, I mean, I just, I took a quick look at the agenda for tonight, and, you know, it looks like there should be some interesting topics to cover. So um, just take it from there, you know? Okay. Um, so... I'm just looking over the list of, um, oh, Michelle Kim, I'm sorry, she was a presenter, a, a panelist tonight. I mentioned her earlier, of course. Um, so Barbara, what are we gonna do? We need to, I suppose we should start it. My computer says 6.30, what does yours say? Barbara, should we start? Uh, I think so, 6.30, I think we should. Okay, so. And you. you since yeah. no one else has joined, Clary, um, do you want to take uh, minutes for the first item and I'll take the last three? I guess we'll do it that way. Um, so Barbara and I will be multi multitasking tonight, but that's not so unusual. Um, for the, We have a very big agenda item to start and I'm going to, pursuant to what Barbara and I discussed earlier, I'll sort of be the primary MC on that item, which is the boat basin, and I'll also do the minutes for that part. And Barbara will be the primary MC on the next three items that we have on tonight, which are quite diverse. Um, so um, I guess we should get started. Um, so Excuse our Ari, I think somebody should try to get more people to the meetings. We don't have a quorum yet. And although technically you can start the meeting without that, I mean, it seems pointless to me to do that if you're planning to take a vote at some point. Well, I mean, Susan, what could we do now? I mean, we don't, we have no idea whether Natasha or we, I, I think we have a good idea that Elizabeth Caputo is not going to join us and we know why, but I don't think we can do anything to get Natasha or um, Holly here at this point. The, those are the other ones who are missing. I don't maybe, know. maybe we do have a quorum if they're, because I, I forgot Doug's no longer on the board. So. Right. We have, we, actually, we have yeah. four out of seven. Yeah. Laurie, if you don't have a quorum, you can't vote, but you certainly can hear the... Uh... Yeah, no, I thanks, Roberta. That's what we said earlier, and I, I, I think that's right. And we do have four out of seven, so we have a quorum. Yeah. You do have seven members of the committee now? Yeah. Yeah, so we have a quorum anyway. So we're we have not. A quorum. Okay. So, oh, have a quorum. Yeah, and right. also just following up on greetings to our some of our regulars, Jeff Martin, I see his photo there, um, has joined us. Jeff is the manager, day-to-day -day manager of Riverside Park. So, and he typically joins us for our monthly meeting. So uh, welcome, Jeff. Um, so let's start our first item, which is a presentation um, from EDC, at Economic New York City Economic Development Corporation and the Parks Department and their uh, technical consultants, their consultants on their current plans for the um, replacement and expansion of the 79th Street Boat Basin. So um, we went through some hoops today to make sure we sent out um, panelist invitations to a long list. And I see that most of those people on that list are here. Um, who's gonna be sort of doing the, running that show from your end of the presenters? That, that'd be me, Stephen Frack with Moffat Steve? Nickel. Okay, and um, Moffat Nickel is the is the consultant. So primary That's consultant. right, AE. Okay. Yep. So welcome, Stephen. Thank how you, you. How do you pronounce your last name? Freck, as if with a K. Right. Um, 
So, Stephen, you guys sent us a, um, a number of things, a slide presentation, which I have just, we've distributed to all of our members of the committee. And you also, um, uh, about a week before, sent a, a letter response to the letter that we had um, sent uh, after the initial presentation to us on this project. In um, that was in December of 2019. Our letter was early in January 2020. So we got that response from you um, a couple weeks ago. I sent those materials as well, our letter, which has been on our website, and the response to all of our committee members. And all of this was an attempt to have the meeting go as smoothly as, and, as it can. We've also been joined by Polly Spain, who is one of our committee members. So we are more than a quorum now. We've got five out of seven. Um, so Stephen, what we'd like you to do, I think, is to um, go through your presentation in whatever way you think is makes sense. You know, some of the slides are a little less crucial than others, but sure. You. Yep. Uh, try to do that in maybe 15 to minutes, 20. I think there's gonna be a lot of discussion. I think that's what sounds good. good. Sounds good. And um, so you are able to share a screen and do that, right? Yeah, it looks like I can. Yeah, yep. okay, that's great. And um, so we'll have you do that. I'm gonna ask people not to uh, interrupt or to, uh, in fact, um, who's our, Barbara, Susan, should we have everybody mute other than me and Barbara at this point, or is that gonna be helpful? Um, okay, suggest that everybody mute other than. Yeah, it's recommended to everyone mute, so just to present our, and there's okay. no the background noise, thank you. Okay. And, and the, and the co-chairs, because we may, may need to say something. Um, Alana, you're upside down, <laughs> upside down but whatever. Um, so we know we've got a, a number of, of people from the agencies and from the, um, uh, the consultant, if you want to introduce them, however you want to do it, Steve. Sure. And then we'll do questions, comments, whatever. Let me just ask you one thing up front, and that is, are you looking for a resolution from us tonight? Because I know you're going to the PD, we know, we know you're going to the PDC. Yes, I think so. Um, we are. Okay, so why don't you start, and just one other thing. As you go through your presentation, it would help, Alana, you're right side up now, um, if you can um, mention when, if, and when, um, and I think there are some whens, uh, your current plans differ yeah. from what we saw in December of 2019. Sure. Okay. I think I tried, tried to highlight that. You're All on. right. I appreciate that. Thank you for uh, setting me up for success. Let me uh, share this screen. Um, you, you've got that, right, the presentation? Yes, we definitely did. The whole committee has gotten it. Uh, and I'm sharing my screen. I guess it'd be more, you've got my screen. You, know, you can see it in front of you. We do. Okay, I appreciate that. So, uh, so we're here, uh, as we mentioned the second time, uh, about a year and a half after December last time, um, for, but just to let you know sort of what we've progressed, which I think is an important thing to, to tell you about, we're at 30% you know, design. I'll tell you more about that milestone and how it's significant for the environmental assessment and the regulatory that we're doing. But we didn't work um, full time on this. We were actually suspended um, for over half that time. So we've um, just picked the project up in the last couple of months and been able to advance to the 30% uh, milestone. And I can show you some of that. Um, let me get to this screen. Okay, so the uh, uh, goals, I think I'll skip over a lot of it, but the goals have um, you know, not changed from before. We wanna meet the current climate change resilience, enhance the, the safety and navigation of the, of the uh, basin, make it perform as it could. Um, deliver essentially ADA access, uh, utilities, uh, everything that complies with modern codes, standards, um, uh, especially in resilience uh, space. We've been having a lot of interaction with FEMA uh, uh, regarding this design, especially since you know a lot of the funding is coming from them. Uh, expand the number of boating berths. There's, uh, I know, um, uh, pinup demand for this site and upgrade the dock house to comply with this, um, with a fully expanded facility. You know, especially this group, 
knows where we are. I'll uh, fly some of this. That you know the history of the site. I'm sure um, you're bound to be very familiar with um, you know the site. One thing that's worth noting on this, because uh, some of the concerns are about uh, access uh, and security. And one thing that we can note on this slide is there's currently you know the entrance on a dock. And you have three other entrances, and um, we've we've tried to preserve that and address some other issues. So, but you you know the site. Um, more on the site. So, if you look at this wave screen, I mean it's it's damaged. But one of the things we've learned, one thing we've done since we saw you last, is complete some uh, uh, numeric studies of the performance of that wave screen, and it performs about like it looks in that picture. Um, and we intend to upgrade that. Um, like I said, we just sort of pick back up. We're really here at the beginning with you today at the uh, uh, next phase of our outreach effort um, based on our 30% uh, milestones. This is a slightly updated, but we're just now in the phase of the project where we're beginning our second, raid, uh, um, second um, round of outreach. And there's another one coming too, and I'll talk about that too. Um, so the site, so here's what you've seen before, largely the same geometric arrangement, but we've done some work to confirm some things. We've also uh, been studying the project. We're tracking it to make sure that the project can be delivered for the available construction funding. So part of that, and this change is what you see over here on the left is for uh, H and I doc, there's not an intention to uh, construct those now. We would still design the facility to include that. Um, we would like to dredge that area um, you know, on day one, but not construct uh, the floating docks. We may not dredge it, but still ask for the permit to dredge it. So that's, uh, we're working on that now. Um, we're also in coordination with Transco for the gas pipeline. Um, and the probably the most significant thing sort of from a user experience is the work that we did to uh, complete the analysis of the requirements of the wave screen. Um, I forget if I mentioned before, and if I forget, maybe you do too, last time I saw you. Um, we were just at that point, maybe halfway through sampling about six months worth of on-site uh, wave and current data. Uh, and since then, we've compiled that and performed an analysis of the wave screen. And as I mentioned, it turns out it's a debris screen. It's uh, trans energy transmission coefficient, but it transmits about 98% uh, of its energy. That's on ADOC right now, but uh, our intent is to put in a proper wave screen. Um, so the, what's changed is now we know what that is. And I'm gonna show you some uh, slides about what that, what that is. That allows us uh, to know that we're attenuating uh, the wake waves in addition you know, to the wind-driven waves. Um, it also lets us know that we're working with DEC to come up with a minimum size of everything that we could possibly put in. But these, what I'd call the T-heads here, like at B dock, E dock, F dock, uh, we know that those wanna be beefed up uh, to provide additional attenuation for the waves uh, inside that opening. Um, with that work, we've also confirmed that we want to orient the slips, uh, basically, since it's protected for wave, uh, to, to orient the slips so we're resisting uh, current most efficiently. So we've taken, um, you know, that uh, hopefully off the table with, um, you know, concern, concerns for wake. Um, the other thing you'll see in this, um, in this image with the arrows, you know, is the same number of entrances. Um, uh, and distributed, as I think you would remember from before, or, or maybe maybe you don't. Um, you know, the dock house it needs to be elevated to be resilient. Um, it also needs to be located inside the facility to be secure, um, and to provide you know equitable access for you know the dock master uh, in response to, to service, but also primarily for uh, incidents as they go along. Um, so the dock house is over here, it's elevated. So one of the things that that um, has the uh, you know, knock-on benefit of doing 
is moving uh, sort of the, you know, the, the primary uh, egress point away from directly in front of the rotunda. There's another one, ancillary, but I don't think it's going to have as much traffic as this. Um, so that's, you know, that's the facility. Let me go to the next page. Um, this is, you know, we, um, this is the mechanical layout. I'm not going to spend any time on it. If we want to go back, we can. Um, one of the things we've done also is a lot of work on how we're going to connect the utilities. So, and uh, also that goes to the amount of site disturbance. And the other thing that's we've also worked out as part of, you know, the environmental assessment that we we're uh, preparing and submitting drafts of for comment uh, to FEMA is uh, construction impacts and what those would be. So similar to before, we know that there's not space to stage construction in Riverside Park. Um, additionally, you know, the rotunda construction is either kicking off or uh, the, the rotunda construction is underway and will be underway. Um, I know they've taken some of, uh, taken might not be fair, but they're using some of um, Riverside Park. Um, and so there's just no space. So we know we're coming from the water. Um, I, that's gonna be one of the constraints uh, on the contractor. In a certain sense, it'll be an opportunity too. Um, but for the first time in the site's history, we're gonna actually connect it to the city sewer system. Um, that includes the Rotunda project. Um, and we're also gonna uh, route new electrical um, in this essentially utility trench that sh should be buried for resiliency reasons in the promenade. So it's coming out from the rotunda uh, down to the uh, new location of the dock house. Uh, that would be the primary upland site disturbance. I think the intent is to do this in a single phase of construction. Um, if there won't be a need to provide temporary power to the marina, which would greatly kind of uh, complicate and extend the duration of doing this. And so uh, the intent would be to do this in, in one construction, construction season um, and then move to the construction of the marina. So that's the extent of, of the upland disturbance. Um, some of these I'm going to fly through before, which is, you know, the dock house is a, is a teeny little thing from 1936. Um, and this programming, the goals of the uh, dock house programming criteria have not changed, although we have uh, fully developed them. The um, resilience approach has not changed either, either which is essentially um, we're going to be Required, um, and it would only make sense to uh, elevate uh, this dock house. It is uh, open. There's no use down below. There's no enclosure on the lower pier. It's, it's used for circulation. The stairs will go down there, um, you know, from the, from the upper dock house. But as you can see on this slide, the mapped elevation right now in the FEMA map is 15. Um, We've added 29 inches of uh, sea level rise um, to that uh, for an elevated uh, design flood elevation. We're baking that into a lot of things that we're doing here, including the length of the guide piles. Also, it's always a trick to set the elevation of the fixed piers that are designed to serve vessels in the water, not too high for a future use, but make them uh, adaptable. So we're working on that. And essentially the, uh, uh, the dock house is elevated uh, above that. So that remains true, but we've developed it. Here's some of what we've developed this to get to your point regarding, um, you know, what's changed uh, on the left and the conceptual was, this is the lower deck below the, the dock house. We've trimmed that as much as we can, uh, basically to support circulation. We also, for structural reasons, want this deck to brace these columns that you see on the, on the screen, but we've taken about 1,700 feet uh, out of the, the lower deck. Uh, the same uh, work is reflected in the uh, upper level. The building enclosure still remains um, 4,300 square feet roughly, uh, but the outdoor deck is being um, reduced to provide two things, minimum required for the two sets of egress required by the code and also uh, sight lines for the dock master to be able to observe all of the marina. Um, one thing I think is worth noting in here, again, the vertical circulation is not inside the enclosure. Uh, to me, that's another uh, benefit 
uh, from resiliency that there's 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 basically no it's elevated and there's no openings into the enclosed space uh also with us tonight is uh the architect of record uh craig small with uh, uh b thayer these are uh, their renderings um but that's another development you know before we had a massing study so now we've developed a, a uh, you know, a few views in response to your, your concerns to hope it illustrate kind of what this uh, will look and I guess just as importantly feel like. Um, so uh, from uh, up above, essentially the path adjacent to the rotunda, um, down on the promenade, again, elevated, open to below. Um, you know, you can see some of the material palette here. One of the other things we've done is pick the material actually for the wave screen. It will be recycled plastic lumber. Um, some of that will be uh, uh, reflected in the cladding here, metal cladding. I think we have some precedence at the end of the deck, uh, at the end of this deck. Um, uh, rendering from, um, you know, basically if you're standing on the bridge, walking off the promenade uh, underneath the dock house, what you would see. Um, I think important here is, uh, as far as the material palette, is timber deck, which is true of all of the structures. Um, that will be a treatment. Basically, the, the, the structures are going to be steel and concrete. And we're going to put a timber deck essentially to match a dock. We're going to do the extension of a dock, you, you may recall, bring it out to the pier headline. Uh, so we're going to use that same uh, material palette. I'll show you how that, that structure uh, works. Um, a view from the po uh, promenade looking out. Again, the fairways are perpendicular to the shore. So as you walk along, you'll have, you know, you'll be looking down a length of fairway. Out on the far side, that would be um, the western pier with a uh, wave screen on it. Um, and this would be a view looking at the uh, standalone wave screen on the south. So this is looking north. Um, and again, you can see essentially out of the pier headline, the Western Pier and the, and the floating slips in between. Uh, a view from ADOC, an existing ADOC, looking back into the area for um, some of the human powered boating uh, is uh, here adjacent in the corner and some of the smaller slips as well. Um, this is a bit technical, maybe, maybe not. I won't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, it gives you a little bit uh, more of a feel essentially for you know how that there's glazing on the west side, um, again, for access, and it wraps around on the two sides, glazing windows, you know, uh, windows. So for the uh, uh, marine piers, we've worked hard to optimize the width um, because one of the um, desires is, is to have the, you know, uh, minimum width that we can, but we have also completed, we got the results back, I think a year and a half ago, the drilling rig was in the field. Uh, since then, we've gotten the uh, results of those. Um, and so we've done the uh, technical analysis uh, of the piles and uh, we're gonna have to work pretty hard. So we, we really optimized uh, this structure. Uh, important on this would be the wave screen. You know, on the left is the Western Pier, the one that's, you know, out uh, running uh, parallel to the, the pier headline. So you can see that the wave screen is, um, you know, it's, I think the current one is one foot below mean low water, um, more or less. Um, so it's maybe minus three, seven, five. So we're talking about uh, more robust structure, uh, deeper wave screen. That's actually where the energy is. Like the shallower one essentially lets the uh, wave energy uh, transmit underneath. Uh, the one on the inside, I'd like to optimize uh, to be shallower. Um, just to save money for the project, but we're not, haven't done that yet. Um, utility trace, utility chase in the piers. So these are the steel, uh, steel piles, uh, concrete caps, essentially precast planks that will be set that will have the U shape for the utility chase. A lot of the thinking that we've done about adaptation strategy for sea level rise in setting these uh, is uh, to keep this utility chase essentially uh, out of the water over the course of the project. And we can talk more about other adaptation uh, strategies uh, as you care to. Um, you can see that the um, that pier is lower. Uh, D-Dock is higher. If you remember, D-Dock is essentially the access pier. 
um, coming out from the dock house that goes out to the Western Pier on both sides of that down low are um, floating docks. Um, and um, I feel like I want to show that to you. And I think I'm okay on time, so it won't take too long. Um, there we go. So that's, this is, you know, the fixed D dock. These are the fixed piers, these dark blue uh, structures. This is an extension of A dock. It was, um, oddly enough, the existing facility was not built to the pier headline. So we're gonna take advantage of that. And I'll make the facility as, as, as uh, you know, use the space that, that we have. Um, one of the aspects about that is what's the, or one of the questions that we got was, you know, what is the, why is it like this, I guess, you know? Um, so, one of the things that happens is, is that when vessels come in, certainly some of them, the dock master or, you know, the person, the parks personnel are going to interact, you know, the, uh, what do they need? What are the, you know, collection of fees, directions, all of it. Um, so to have this centrally located, it's uh, a low freeboard. You know, it's uh, the floating docks are much lower in the water than the fixed piers. And so you can service many different boats, many different sides, kind of uh, transient uh, in a transient nature in here. Uh, and then, you know, then this person can make it to a slip depending on their needs. Um, so that's what we're looking at in um, these uh, cross sections. We'll get to it. So this would be, you know, this would be the D dock. It can be higher, you know, cause it's not serving vessels. Essentially this is promenade elevation right now. Um, the A dock extension, we're not ramping up from existing uh, A dock. So currently the A dock, it's, it's a wider structure to match the original one, uh, a more, um, you know, a, a more resilient system from durability would be a three pile system. So we're gonna use an additional uh, pile in that area. Um, so uh, yeah, there's some of the, um, um, you know, material pallets and the precedents. I think you remember from before the green roof remains uh, in the, the dock house. I don't think I mentioned it when I was on that slide. So. Uh, green roof, um, you know, metal panel, aluminum windows. Um, you've, you've seen some of this in the earlier renderings. Um, then I, a, a little bit more on uh, site access um, and security. Um, you know, I'm, I'm aware as also, you know, as a cyclist, well, I think the last time I rode my bike over there was 10 years ago. I understand the uh, bike has been uh, rerouted, but I remember how tight this is. I just know how tight it is uh, right in front of the rotunda. Right now, we essentially, you know, have, um, you know, the existing, um, you know, sea rail with some grates, you know, with some grading at these four locations. And the intent is when we, for the new, is to maintain that uh, essentially. So we have a very low open uh, uh, um, rail along the promenade. If I understand correctly, it's not actually parked as current standard, but it's, it's, it's acceptable uh, to replace that. So we wanna keep that character uh, in the locations where we have a gate. We also have you know, uh, some type of steel picket. I'll show you on the next slide what that might look like. And a, um, there, because I didn't mean to actually go to that, but we'll come back to it one sec. Um, also in these, at the floating docks where the gangways comes down, those get very close to the shore. It would be, and because this rail is so low, it'd be pretty easy to, um, if you're 20, to uh, jump on, on those. So, um, you know, there'll be a picket down there. So essentially, um, that type of protection at the entrance and at these floating docks as well. Uh, and again, the same three entrances. Uh, I've mentioned, I think previous, like I imagine this is the most heavily used. Uh, this is an access uh, site access as well. Um, but um, it's all of these will be um, uh, controlled gates, you know, similar to what they have now, except I think they might not work now sometimes. Um, yeah, so all of this access controlled uh, gates, publicly accessible, everybody can get in. Um, some other, so this is the sea rail that we're, you know, it's, it's there now, it's what we're gonna use um, going forward. Um, for the marine sea rail, which will also be on uh, D dock, you know, I'm showing that on the side of these two D docks and out here at the extension of A, 
um, where I think there will be, I think there is now some classroom activity, or this is a, this is a place where typically, uh, you know, uh, kids are hosted, groups are hosted. I think that's going to remain to be the case. Uh, so this C rail steel picket, uh, um, you know, gate going forward. Um, the marina itself, uh, concrete, the, like only an engineer would know this, but like, you know, the, with what we learned about the geotech, I wasn't sure what pile was going to work. Uh, and the pile and the floating dock are uh, systems are, um, you know, uh, they lean on each other. What you can do with one influences what you, what you can do on the other. So the co concrete floating docks remain in the scheme, aluminum gangways. Uh, again, the piles, I don't remember the elevation off the top of my head, but extended above the future sea level rise, at least, I think, four feet plus the uh, floating dock uh, free bar, uh, uh, free board. Uh, vertical plank uh, wave screen, it's going to not have any gaps in it, um, but it did not have a great picture to show you. Did we just lose you, Stephen? What are you? Can I, people hear I Steve? Think, this is Steve Brown speaking, I think, uh, Stephen's has frozen, so I think it's a hit. How do, we, uh, how do we unfreeze him? There's nothing you can do. We, we've got to wait him out. And, uh, let's see if he's going to either pause or jump back in. I don't know if anybody else on the team uh, can jump in for a little bit while Steven probably tries to realize that nobody's hearing. Is anybody else from the from the uh, from this team that can speak a little bit? Jump in. Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's Nate. Hey, Hi, good. Thanks for having us. Clary, setting us up for success. I like Steven saying there. I agree. I haven't heard the whole story yet. But uh, we I, there's always more we story. So, <laughs> um, so I, and Steven, if you can hear us, thank you. I think that was the final slide, actually. So yeah. maybe th this message is sell set to destruct in uh, two seconds. So maybe that's what happened. Um, but I think Stephen uh, did a good job of covering where we are. Again, I think I think what you're seeing is a lot of what you already saw, but I think it's good to get back together as we're at that 30% stage and, and really um, present again. And and uh, and what I, Stephen and EDC can probably speak better about what lies ahead. Um, so, but um, I don't think there was anything else in Stephen's presentation. I did see one q and A. I'll, I'll let Stephen. I think he touched upon it. He can go to that a little more deeply about um, orientation of the births, uh, perpendicular versus parallel. I'll just say, um, and Seth, my my deputy's on the line. He's on the call as well. There was a lot of uh, uh, close focus on that. Um, the, the the amount of wave analysis was was really pretty pretty uh, pretty intense um, no pun intended but the, uh, the, the really kind of monitoring the different um, forces hitting the site and how best to maximize the slip layout and and the, and the vessel orientation we can get into that a little more um, but um, actually why not I guess that's the first question in the queue so um, absent Stephen Seth do you want to speak to that a little more well actually we don't that's fine, uh, but we don't usually look at the do. The first thing we do is not normally use do the Q and A. We the co chairs call on people and we do questions and got um, it in, in whatever order. But nevertheless, you've mentioned the parallel versus uh, perpendicular. And if Stephen, if are, is Stephen back with us? Stephen Fresh. Doesn't uh, look like. But in that case, Nate um, and. Let me just say something first um, for those who don't understand this, and I think I've got this, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, e the EDC is the agency that is sort of uh, running this operation, but on behalf of the Parks Department as their client agency, um, Nate is kind of the, uh, I think this is an informal way of describing Nate Grove's job, but he's kind of the maritime honcho for um, citywide uh, Parks Department for maritime matters. Um, so Nate, as long as you can hear us, and I think Stephen may, maybe can't. I think on the perpendicular thing, the answer was perpendicular, right? That's what the plans show: is you're realigning the um, the uh, 
appears to be perpendicular to the shore. Um, so Seth, why don't you um, oh, Seth, okay. get into the, the analysis there a little more? Sure, can folks hear me okay? Yes. Can anyone hear me? Yes. Yes, yes we can. Okay, uh, I apologize, I may not have a great connection. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, so uh, I think Stephen alluded to it in, in his uh, presentation. It's something that I know um, the engineers studied. So what the, um, the question was about um, in, in, a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a river marina like the uh, 79th Street Bow Basin on the Hudson River, you, you've kind of got two opposing forces to contend with. There's the north-south flow of the current, which can be very powerful and make maneuvering difficult. And then there's also, uh, I think what the, uh, the email comment was about, was about there's uh, an increasing amount of wakes just with the uh, greater amount of boat traffic. <clears throat> when uh, in our design, the, uh, the, the, uh, the slips for the boats are oriented in a north-south, they're parallel roughly to the river. So they'll be in line with the north-south uh, flow of the current on the Hudson River. Um, the concern was that that also that could put the boats broadside there, so their their longest uh, exposed you know side to the uh, the kind of the more east west flow of the wakes that come from boats traveling up and down the river. What Stephen was alluding to, and one of the things we sort of discovered, a couple of things that um, there's no question these are, these are sort of both both forces that one way or the other have to be mitigated for um, the the mitigation that's going on here. Well, the the current situation of the wakes that do violently batter a lot of the boats inside the marina, as well as the marina itself, come from the fact that the, the wave screen itself is, well, A, so deteriorated that it's, it's so porous that it's not, um, that it's allowing too much wake energy to travel inside into the marina. Secondly, that there's also with the lack of dredging, the shallow water creates a bit of, um, <clears throat> especially at low tides, creates almost a, you know, a breaking wave inside the marina that makes the wake situation much, much more violent. Um, so in their study, Moffat and Nickel discovered, I mean, aside from those current conditions, which are observable and products of the deterioration of the marina and the lack of dredging, they also discovered that essentially the original wave screen really was never uh, built as robustly as it could, that it was, it's more effective perhaps for debris, uh, but that its, its actual design allows for too much transfer of energy to go inside the marina. Um, so as I understand it, I'm, again, I'm not an engineer, but that we're, we feel that the new design can mitigate for the wakes by being a robust, properly designed, properly depth, uh, or rather just deep enough wave screen. Also, I think uh, Stephen alluded to that several of the T heads, and I think this was, I think I saw a Q and A about this as well, um, where the entrances are, for example, um, any of those T-head docks will be of a lower depth. So those will also absorb and a lot of any wave uh, action that comes in. So given that we can actually mitigate for the waves, there's really no way to mitigate for the current. You're not gonna, we're not gonna stop the Hudson River. So having a north-south orientation for the slips is generally preferable for most boaters because you have more control when you're actually docking, when you're actually entering or leaving your slip, it's a lot easier. So essentially, if you have to choose one or the other, because we're able to mitigate for the wave action and the wave energy that comes into the basin better, that we wanted to go with the preferable, uh, with the, the orientation of the slips that's preferable for navigation. I hope that makes sense. Yes, thank you, uh, Seth. So um, what we're gonna do, and you know, we, We've got a long way to go on this, and we have other items, of course, tonight later. So um, what we typically do, and I want to do here, is um, start with some quest just some questions from committee members. And if we have time, a couple minutes, other board members, if we have other board members here. And then um, we'll be then looking to uh, comments and questions from the community, who are people who are not board members and then a uh, discussion um, among um, the committee. So I, I wanted to start out with a couple of factual and other type questions myself, and then I'll turn to others, um, Barbara and I will call on others. Um, just one first, to, just to comment on your terminology. On your, um, on your slides and in the letter you sent to us, I think it was, you frequently use the word promenade, 
which I think you mean to be as fairly clear in context to be synonymous with the Esplanade. Um, the Esplanade is the, with an initial cap, is the name of the path along the river that's also the, uh, the footpath and it's also the greenway, et cetera. The promenade is actually named for a, an, upper, <laughs> an upper pathway in the, in the park. So consistently calling it the Esplanade, I think would be helpful. Um, so other questions I had though, uh, you um, mentioned, uh, we have Stephen back, if not somebody else will have to um, answer, um, that we're 30% into the design and this is the second um, outreach um, in the letter to us, you mentioned uh, uh, coming back to present in the summer of 2020, which is of course coming and gone. Um, my question is, is this the last time or is this not the last time uh, you're planning to come to CB7 um, with, your, with the plans? Because you're about to go to PDC. Who can answer that? We, I mean, of course we plan, this is Julia Melzer with EDC, we always plan for continued engagement with our community boards across the, the project, uh, you know, life cycle of our project. So, you know, we uh, plan to come back with an update on the final design, which really is just a tweaking. I mean, the preliminary design is, um, you know, really where you've spatially laid out a project and, you know, general massings and material palettes. And then it's more like technical um, tweaking from, from the preliminary design phase to, to final. But yes, we can certainly plan to come back with final design updates. And then we always engage with our local stakeholders as we enter a construction phase, which um, you know, will be more in- you know. Julia, I, I believe that the press release, which we didn't get from you, but we saw and, and got from the Parks Department website, described this design as the final design. So, but it's not really, I guess you're saying. Okay. I don't recall the exact verbiage offhand. Um, but you know we are we're at a thirty percent design phase, so which is roughly equivalent to entering into prelim, preliminary design and broad strokes. Um, the design team will have about fifty percent of the final design completed the fall of twenty twenty one, and about a year later in fall of twenty twenty two, one hundred percent of design documents. Um, and so at this point, you don't have a, or, or you're not putting it out to bid at this point, I assume. No, and, and as Stephen somewhat alluded to, this is a critical point. You know, once you've really begun to nail down the scope and size of a project, we can do all of our, you know, environmental assessment um, coordination with um, those entities and begin our permitting process with DEC and other, any other agencies with purview over the project. So from here, we'll you know, take any feedback on our, you know, permitting process, incorporate that in the design and together with any technical, um, you know, design detail additions that, that will all be combined into the final design issuance. Okay. A couple of other questions before, from me before turning to others. Um, the press release uh, said that you will be closed, that the marina is too dangerous and decrepit and you'll be uh, basically closing it and, um, not allowing voters to remain there after this November. The press release, I think, was also said construction will start in 2023, which seems at least optimistically consistent with what you just said. So a couple of questions there. Um, will, uh, and something you also said to us in one of these documents was that Pier A will be part of the construction site. That's the public pier that we can all walk on and, and enjoy in season. Will Pier A, uh, the public pier, remain open until construction starts, or is that to be closed off as well in this November? Nate, I'll defer to you on sure. any Sure, um, Clary. Yeah, the 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 uh, the determination uh, followed a, a, a marine engineer inspection. So, to be honest, we wanted to get the word out as as quickly as we could. Um, we, we, I guess we, you know, we 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 we. Uh, you know, we, we, in some ways, we, we've 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 been in denial, I suppose, trying to keep keep the site going, and 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 we, you know, this inspection kind of revealed that that that's not really um, a viable path, a responsible path forward. So that's a roundabout way to say we've still got to work out the fine details. One thing we do know is that the the structures that haven't been rebuilt aren't safe. Hi, Stephen. Welcome back. So sorry. Um, that's okay. Um, that, that the structures that haven't been rebuilt 
aren't aren't safe for another winter season, another storm season. So my it's a fine question. A doc, I would hope we could do that, but in until we get the the the, the fine tuning of how the wind down through November, that's the first focus is working with each of the boaters to make sure they're accommodated. Um, but but it would be my hope. I don't want to speak for the agency. I, I'm not going to have a place for staff to be. So we'll, we'll have to discuss that internally within parks. Um, any, any negative impact that might have to ADOC. It would be my hope. And I would, I would think all of our hope that we could keep that uh, accessible. Yeah. To the I, mean, public. I don't, I don't want to completely belabor this, but given that ADOC was newly reconstructed and is the one part of the marina that the public, all of our public the park users can use and walk on and enjoy. Yeah. Um, I think it's fair to say that CB7 would very much like to see ADOC remain open to the public, um, if at all practical, um, until you get to the point where you're in actual construction, which is going to be at best 2023. We hope not later. Um, sure. I hear you, Clary. Okay. We'll, 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 that's questions. our hope as well. I have one other question, and I want to turn then to many other questions from other people because we need to bop along here. Um, in your letter to us, when we asked about any new or, or plans for commercial use for concessions uh, in the newly done marina, your answer was not any different from what they are now. Um, it, that's a slight abbreviation and paraphrase. That's not defined. And so um, what does that mean? That is, will the marina be used just for boat uh, boaters to dock and, 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 and the slips and on the moorings, um, sure. et cetera, yeah. or are you planning as, as without notice to us, there was in fact a party boat concession at the end of, at the, I think at the end of Pier A, which uh, was then dropped because of lack of parking, um, but that's a whole different story. And so. Is that about 17 years ago? No, no, oh, much more. No, 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 much more recently. Mm. So what yeah, it was 2003, 2004. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the Festiva. Um, so yeah, so for the last at least 16 years, there's been no commercial operations. We did make, when, when I got to the site, we saw that there were some uh, boaters uh, doing uh, six passenger charters, six packs as they're called. Um, it, it wasn't really codified. Uh, we, we did work with those boaters when we, we we as an agency determined that that seemed to be a nice offering for people who don't have boats and might want to get out on the water for a romantic tour, you know, special event, celebrate an anniversary, Valentine's Day. Um, so we have allowed that to continue. We codified that in the rules. Um, and uh, that's our expectation. That That's when you hear no changes, that's the expectation moving forward. No yeah. party boats, no booze cruises, um, no fishing charters, that's other than a six no, passenger if they no. want to go out fishing, but nothing like what you'd see out at like a Sheep's Head Bay Piers. And, and no private special events, I hope or assume. I'm, I'm just asking. Uh, I'm sorry, can you be more specific? Uh, somebody rents it for their bar mitzvah. The boat? A no, boat? No, or part of the pier. The, the pier? Um, or, or for that matter, a boat off of the pier, right. You're right. Well, we don't allow dockside events. Seth and I are always kicking any boats who think they can do that off of Sheepshead Bay Piers. Um, so um, I can tell you in my time, I've, I've turned away those sorts of uses, but that's not always fully up to my division <laughs> use of parkland. That falls into the general rubric of what is permitted and what is not. I mean, you could argue is a film shoot good for the marina or not as well? And is that alienating public space? We like to keep I'll speak uh, maybe out of turn a little. We like to keep marinas for the boating community and for those who want to engage the boating community and the, and the marine ecology. And that's what we've done. And the groups you've always seen down there during my and Seth's tenure have all been educational based. They've never been event based. There's been a, a few film shootings, film shoots, um, but we've curtailed those as well because we don't know if that really contributes to the maritime use of the marina. Thanks, Nate. That's answered the questions that I noted as upfront questions. I want to turn to, on um, Barbara and I want to turn to other members of the committee first, but just with questions, and then we'll go into comments and discussion and, and also anything from the members of the community. Ken has his hand up. Ken, okay. okay. Hi. Um, glad you're back, Stephen. Uh, <laughs> um, 
I guess I, I had a comment, but I'll save that. Um, when our, our answer to our question about um, disturbance to the esplanade uh, during construction, um, you said uh, disturbance to the esplanade will be kept at a minimum. Um, that's, I have to say, that's not entirely reassuring. We wouldn't expect you to try to maximize disturbance. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, so and, and, and I just wanna sort of tell you what the stakes are for users of the Esplanade. Um, it's the most used, it's part of the most used north-south bicycle path in North America. Um, right now, cyclists are prohibited from using the waterfront path but during construction of the rotunda, which is going to be happening simultaneous to this in part, um, the uh, cyclists are gonna be, uh, have to go down to the water um, and uh, cohabit with uh, walkers uh, once again um, you know, for a certain period of time. And uh, what I'm really concerned about is when you're doing trenching, um, whatever you have to do to hook up the uh, utility lines, um, that uh, you're going to shut it down for an uh, unspecified period of time. And usually, in my experience, the time is always longer than it's uh, expected to be. Um, and, uh, and cyclists are not going to be able to go um, up to the, um, to the uh, uh, 79th Street either. Um, and uh, so they're really going to have no place to go. Um, and I don't want the city's response to be, well, they just have to go uh, take their chances on city streets. Um, that's not acceptable. Um, and uh, so can you reassure us that there will be no time when um, uh, cyclists uh, will be prohibited, will not have a path somewhere uh, through the park? Um, I'm sorry, before you before you uh -huh. talk about that, Stephen, because I remember we uh, did a dock and we had to close down promenade uh, minimally for the connectivity there and it worked out fine. Um, we put up a little guards and, and redirections, but uh, honest question isn't isn't um, isn't the biking already rerouted pat away from this area of, of the I marina it now anyway? Yeah, that's what I was so, saying. It's, so it's, it's not gonna, it's not gonna impact it's anything. It's not gonna impact you, that. but the rotunda, uh, once construction begins in earnest there, it's um, cyclists, as I said, are gonna be, have to go back down to the water for at least a certain um, uh, That's the plan? Yeah, that yes, is. That's uh, I, didn't, I didn't, that's good to yeah, know. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I didn't know that, okay. Oh. Under construction, cyclists will be back, not using the inland uh, mandated detour, but will be back sharing the whole esplanade, including right by the marina with uh, the rest of us. <laughs> and there are lots of different categories of the rest of us. Understood. Yeah. I mean, I think the good news is the Rotunda project will ultimately have a jump start on us on construction. Um, <clears throat> when we start construction phase, the bulk of that will be the in-water, over-water work, you know, the dredging, demolition, or demolition, and then dredging and um, over-water uh, construction. Quite frankly, you know, we'll need to, we were in the process of hiring a construction manager. We'll need to bring them on board to have their expertise to, you know, review all of the construction logistics. And that would absolutely be something we'd, you know, come back and talk uh, with you all about. It's not our intent to close the Esplanade or desire to. We want to keep it open. As you noted, there ultimately will have to be some utility trenching, but, you know, we're all experts or, you know, EDC is well versed in kind of endeavoring to minimize impacts and, you know, um, working in very tight and confined areas. Uh, so, you know, again, we'll, we'll make all best efforts to avoid any disruption and or minimize disruption to the Esplanade, but quite frankly, that will have to, you know, be assessed um, as we're closer to the construction phase and, and the timing and any coordination with the Rotunda project, because hopefully they'll be far enough along and that kind of trenching work might be further out in our construction schedule that there's, um, you know, not so much overlap. The, the trenching work usually happens yeah. towards the end. Yeah. Again, we'll have to review the, the phasing of the utility work relative to, you know, when the demo schedule takes place and the dredging takes place and then over water work begins and any other, you know, our, our construction schedule will be informed by in water moratorium requirements. So 
all of that, you know, we're, we're again, we're very early in the process. We're focusing on a preliminary design package right now that we're, we're discussing with you all. Absolutely understood on minimizing impacts or avoiding all impacts to the Esplanade. And that is our, you know, our goal, uh, but we'll have to get, you know, review that more closely with you once we have our construction manager on board. I think we should say, as we did in our letter to you, that it's keeping the Esplanade open is such a high priority for us. Uh, uh, Roberta, I see your hand up going just a second. Um, it's, you know, it's not just, although it's thousands of cyclists, it's also thousands of pedestrians and thousands of uh, just park users in general who, um, I mean, that's where you want to be. You want to be down there on the Esplanade. Uh, so, okay. Uh, the only other hand I see from- I, I, I had a couple of more questions. Oh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, why don't we go around and Ken can we we'll come back to Ken? Okay, let's give everybody okay. a chance. Who just said that? Oh, Bart, was that Barbara? I heard to have her hand up before me. No, I know. Who just said that about? Bar Bar I did. Barbara did. Bar I did. Barbara mentioned. Barbara spoke. So, but uh, I think the recommendation is to look at the other hands of members, and then Ken will come yes. back. With an opportunity. Well, you know, that's okay with me. Uh, Roberta, I know, has had her hand up. And as I said, we're about to call on her right now. I have two questions. So I, I understand that you have to do some work on the on the uh, Esplanade. Can that work be done not in the summer months? I mean, is it able, are you able to time it? So it could be, I mean, I know you can't do it during the winter, but if you could do it sort of late fall or early spring when traffic is not as big there. Um, you know, and maybe coordinate with, with the uh, rotunda with when they're gonna be doing some of their major stuff. I, I just wanna say that the parks, Riverside Park has gotten much better about um, the shared bike path, but, but I was on the Esplanade on Monday last week and I almost got hit first by a e-bike and then by a regular bike as I was turning around and a woman screamed and had she not screamed, I wouldn't have stopped and I would have been hit. So we've got to be very careful about that. I thought we were just having questions. Roberta asked whether the work could be done. I asked a question. Yeah. And, but not in the summer. Yeah, again, I think it's a little too early in the phase to uh, be able to slot in when that utility work could take place relative to a season, but certainly something we can ass assess once we're, um, you know, closer to that construction phase. I don't see any other uh, board member hand. Oh, Polly, and then we'll finish with Ken, and then we'll look to the community because we need to be bopping along here. I also had a question. Oh, sure. Let's let's go, Polly. Uh, yeah, Barbara. I had put my question in the chat, but basically um, addressing uh, the concern number five in the letter. I didn't hear anything regarding where the residents of the dock will live while this construction is going on. And my second question is, will DPR manage the uh, kayaking program? Um, thanks for the question, Polly. Um, so to the first question, the, the, um, the boaters, just to be clear, uh, if you're talking about the ones who, who reside there year round, all those vessels are seaworthy and operable, so they'll live in, in their current uh, boats um, as they have. Um, we, we're gonna work with each boater. We distribute a list of 36 area marinas. Uh, some of those we run ourselves. Some are run by some of our concessions. Some are private marinas. So, um, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna really look to see, see what, are, what are the options out there uh, and, and uh, and work work with each of them, but ultimately, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the the good news is these boats are operable, uh, which wasn't the case until maybe eight years ago when we really worked with the community in partnership to make sure all the vessels are seaworthy and operable. So no one's being uh, removed from their home. They can they can they can the boats will be able to come back uh, as soon as the as the project's complete to a, a much improved, safer, navigable to code accessible for the first time in the site's 85 year history. It's never been ADA accessible. So, um, so that, that's gonna be um, part of the uh, process. Um, sorry, the second question, Polly? Uh, about DPR managing the oh, kayaks. kayaks. So um, we, we don't manage any kayak programs uh, mm -hmm. anywhere in the five boroughs. We do have partner groups that, that do programming robustly throughout the five boroughs. Um, 
the closest, well, there's several along the west side of Manhattan. Um, so no, we don't, we don't have plans to manage a kayak program, nor have we ever. Holly, I, I, that is a topic that I personally, when we get to comments, intend to speak about. So we'll be back to that one for sure. Um, Barbara, we're next. And then I see Ira Thank and you. we do want to move to community members as well. And Helen Rosenthal is with us. Hi, I, I had a couple of questions. Um, so once the work starts in 2023, how long do you expect that the, the entire project will take? This is Steven. So um, two construction seasons. Like one of the things is there'll, there'll be a moratorium on in-water work, um, essentially from you know uh, January through June. Um, so that will have a, a impact. We're talking with the EC uh, right now about what's uh, possible. So you know, and as we develop the and if it was purely marine construction, it'd be real easy to kind of determine how you, how you would do that. But with the dock house and a different set of trades, it complicates things a little bit. So there's a period in between, and somebody made the point, and um, I, I think it's it's valid where the uh, promenade work would not be considered in water. Uh, it might be an available window when they could work on that. But currently, right now, um, uh, two years of duration. I don't know if that is, uh, again, because of the moratorium and because we're so early in the design, we haven't developed a construction methodology in, in sequence, um, but a, a two, year, uh, two years to ribbon cutting is, is the concept. Barbara, you had a second. Okay. Uh, have you, uh, are you planning to clear all the moorings as well and everybody who's in them? or will those boats be allowed to stay? And if so, have you considered moving the liveaboards to moorings with a dinghy dock that's accessible? Um, I missed part, since the power went out, I think I missed part of what um, Nate may have mentioned. But um, uh, right now, just because of the condition of the facility um, and the uh, uh, inability to support it, with the dock house, oh, sorry, with the rotunda under construction, I, as I understand it, the marina will be closed before, um, you know, even before the construction is related. It couldn't make it until we could get the project designed and approved, essentially. So, um, the my understanding is 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 that in that first season that's available, that first in water work, one of the activities that would be the first activity to perform would be the demolition and removal of the moorings and the dredge of the basin. Um, the magnitude of that work right now is estimated to take maybe four months. These are all, you know, this is gonna get tuned up, but if we look at it, it suggests that there's not enough time after you perform that activity before the DEC for the sake of the species um, that have habitats there and spawning grounds that you need to suspend that in water work moratorium. These are things we're working on, but it is one, um, the, the current, my current understanding of how the project will be executed. We are concerned about the liveaboards. I know you are too, but I know they're extremely concerned because it is their home and they're going to be relocated right. for, you know, a, a number of years. Um, my last question has to do with the fact that you asked for a resolution tonight and Considering that you're showing us work that is 30% completed, I'm not sure exactly what you're looking for okay. in that resolution and whether it wouldn't be better to wait until you come back to us again. And I, I know I we think we'll have um we'll hear from our GovCo, I believe is still on. If we hear are you there, do you want to speak to our we typically and I think I can speak to it, but we hear please chime in. Um for uh prior to any PDC meeting, we we just need a letter that confirms you've seen our presentation that letter can include comments that letter can also be a resolution so we don't we don't technically require a resolution it's just confirmation that you presented the project You're, you can include any comments in that letter and it can take the form of a resolution if you so choose i um, as we, exactly. i share barbara's concern and, and i think her comment is, is quite uh, important on this but as we have told you um and i think you know 
um, CB7 can only act through its full board. Or we, we can't write a letter in our committee that is an action of our full board. So, um, but let's sort this out when we see where we are at the end of the discussion. Let's, let's move along. Um, so I wrote Mitch, Nick, oh, oh, Helen Rosenthal, our uh, council person. Who just had visited. a stand up for a long time. Yeah, she's had her uh, she, Helen Yeah, Rosenthal. just real quickly, and I know this is gonna be a groaner, but I have to ask it. Is this an opportunity to extend the Esplanade out so that the bike path and the pedestrian path could be side by side safely? Oh, I'm not a groaner. I want to take that one. Um, no, Thank you. I, I would love some type. I would love to create some new land and put the dock house on it. But the most environmentally uh, disruptive thing you can do is to create new land. Uh, and Phil. Um, and so, well, I'm a little bit thinking of if you go north, there's a very nice place where it, it actually the bike path juts into the water, there's no land underneath it. It's sort of like a bridge or something. You're talking about the river walk from 83rd to 91st. Right. I think so. We have um, funding that's specific to the reconstruction and expansion of the marina. Um, that funding scope and approvals from FEMA and from the city uh, does not include uh, oh. project scope for that. But I, I mean, certainly support that project idea for you to advocate for, you know, through your electeds for additional funding. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm the elected. Um, but oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Um, so advocate I'm advocating. No, Helen. <laughs> I'm advocating to myself and wondering how much money it might be and whether or not y'all have scoped it out. It's a pretty important. Um, it, it would be it would be a game changer for our community. Um, I don't know if you know the history of the bike path there, but it would be a game changer, and I think if now would be the opportunity to do it, I really would like to know the feasibility. Yeah. So well, go, go ahead, Stephen. Well, yes, yeah, like from a technical standpoint, I can, you know, the cost of doing that is equal to the cost of any fixed pier, right? Because it's essentially you're talking about trying to build a pile, of, you know, you could build a pile supported pier. So every foot of that takes a foot out of the marina. Um, uh, so that's, you know, and then the, there is still the, we're in negotiations with DEC right now regarding overwater uh, coverage. Um, we've seen where we did some shrinking and also there's studies on the widths of the floating and the fixed infrastructure to be as, uh, to show that we're doing the uh, minimum. One other benefit is we have a water, the piers uh, that we're constructing have a water dependent use. So although it's a negotiation for size, it is allowed as of right. So to put the esplanade, uh, you know, the promenade out on a pile supported structure, um, you have a heavier regulatory lift because it's not, uh, would not be defined as a water dependent use. So there's direct project kind of cost. Then there's the, you know, just sort of the, the purview of the uh, regulatory that is, uh, beyond anything that we've uh, thought of, not to say that, you know, uh, the blue sky thinking is not worthwhile. Um, but as Julia mentioned, the, the funding that we have is tied to, uh, you know, the marina and hazard mitigation, the resiliency of the marina. Um, you know, oh, the, I, I think we can say that there's not a person who uses Riverside Park, certainly nobody on this call who wouldn't like to see the Esplanade um, widened uh, throughout the entirety of its length, actually. But um, I mean, I certainly would. But when we, we have a long history with this, and when the what's called the River Walk, which is the section partly over the river uh, from 83rd to 91st Street, was built, um, and that opened maybe 10 or 15 years ago, that was like a 20 year process with uh, the various marine um, uh, regulatory agencies. And, um, and what we ended up getting, unfortunately, was I think the 14 foot wide path that was um, some of it over the river, some of it over land that was too narrow from the moment. It was too narrow before it even opened. And it's terribly crowded because it's a shared path. But 
it was a massive, uh, uh, just a massive process. Clary, I know we have we have Ira and Stephen, I'll but just, Susan also Ira has been. I'll been just tried. tag on. It. I have to jump in. Sorry, Barbara. Uh, the questions are fantastic, and particularly because we have uh, Council Councilwoman Rosenthal on the phone. The advocacy on on just permitting c could really help. We can't even repair crumbling promenades and esplanades uh, throughout our throughout our system without mitigating. No one's used the term mitigation, so it's 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 a real struggle right now for us to rebuild our waterfronts due to the DEC regulations. Look, if there's something we can do to facilitate this, um, yeah. I'm very interested. Um, I get the challenge. I get that uh, there might be rules that have to be looked at, but it just seems like if we don't think this through, that'll that'll be unfortunate. Our our neighborhood wants it, and. Um, I, I think we have to do it a little bit. Uh, I think we have to give it some energy. So that's my two cents. Okay, great. Okay, I don't see any uh, attendees who have hands up. But we've Clary, got, I Clary. Clary um, this is Steve speaking. There, there's yes. several hands up. I don't, I don't oh, know. I know. Oh, I know. Are there attendees? I'd be happy to call Ira them. Ira and, and you, I think, Steve. And, uh, and Susan also. Oh, and Susan. Susan's been, it's she Susan. can't raise her hand as the host. I, okay, can, I was just looking to see who else there might be, but we're still continuing with board members. So, uh, Ira? Okay, uh, quick take on uh, what Helen just said. It could be possible to uh, at least design in a future uh, scope for where that accommodation could be made at some future date when funding might be available, whether that's five minutes or 50 years from now. And so those accommodations, you always see little lines on drawings, future cantilever. And cantilever gets around the problem of piles. So I just propose that as some way of dealing with that. At least it's planned for, it's thought about whether it's done or not. It's always easier to have a plan in place so one knows where one is going. And then we can at least know how to, what kind of funding to look for in some vague uh, future infrastructure bill. Um, I want to, in my nine to five job, I know what 30% design means. And I just want to make sure that the rest of the board understands. 30% usually means that the basics of the design are complete. You know what it looks like. You know what the scope is. You know what the budget is. You know what you're getting. You don't add things. You don't take away things. So that's what our 30, that's what we're being asked. Anything we want needs to be there now. Anything we don't want needs to come out. That's what 30% is. That's my nine to five job. Um, what I wanted to talk about was not, not those two things, but there is a long history of uh, very good park architecture in New York, whether that is Central Park, whether that is Battery Park City, whether that is Hudson, uh, the Hudson Greenway below us, whether that's Riverside Park, or I can go Prospect, uh, Prospect Park, I can go on for hours. I'm not going to bore the Parks Department with all their facilities here. Nor am I going to make any comments about the piers because the piers need to meet the technical requirements of the boats. What I'm going to talk about is the dock house itself. And the dock house itself does not even approximate the, the, any design standard that is deserving of New York City Park architecture. There are a couple of architects who are not on this call. There are a couple of planners who are not on this call. And I don't know if they've seen it, but it's really the single most disappointing piece of municipal architecture I have seen it's it's really needs to be rethought. It has all the grace of the of the East Berlin uh, coach uh, boarding um, building in 1975. It really needs improvement. And I've got to tell you, there are enough buildings that have come to the Public Design Commission in that state and have left the Public Design Commission far, far, far improved. And I really hope that the PDC 
thinks about what this is, but I'd also like to think that the Parks Department thinks about this before it goes to PDC. And I'd like to think that it um, is rethought a little before it comes back to us as uh, CB7. And th that's my comment as uh, an architect working both in the public sector and with, and with decades of experience in the private sector. It really, it's next to the rotunda, which is, you know, for whatever you think about it, it's, it's significant. We're, it looks like the parking booth for the rotunda, but it's up on a pier. So please really rethink that. Um, Thanks, Ira. Stephen, that's all I got to say. Thanks, Ira. Stephen, you had a question because we need to finish with Ken. I realize I had one more question and then we will do our next stage of what we're talking about. Hey, my, my, what I wanted to tell you is there's a lot of hands in the Q&A. I know that Susan wanted to speak, so I'm going to defer to Susan. I'll be happy to wait till last. There's about a half dozen questions in the Q&A that I'd be happy to walk through. They're getting even more. Well, what's um, odd is we don't actually typically use the Q&A, so we're going to have to figure out how to... So I will read the Q&A and we can do a session on how to do that, but so that's how the community shares their questions and it's all the community. Let's I would it. Let's finish with the board questions, please. And then we'll figure out how we're gonna deal with the Q and A. So, well, what I'm letting you know is, and this is what other people do if you haven't done it before, is I'll, again, I'll defer to Susan, I'll defer to Ken. I want other people to speak. I was happy to speak last. And then what you can do is I'll be happy to read the Q and A. They're quick answers that the board can I answer. Think can, I think we can do that ourselves, Stephen. But Susan, was your hand up? Yeah. Yes, thank you so much, Stephen. Oh, because um, you can't raise your hand. Okay, Stephen. That's correct, I can't as host. Um, so I'd like to just uh, piggyback on what Ira said about the design and I would urge um, a re-looking at the design. It's, it, it seems uh, overly harsh and modern to me. Um, and I, I've heard so much about using the, the vernacular and the vocabulary that's in the park when it comes time to do you know, park benches and other structures. Um, I would think that something less modern and less harsh would be um, would be nice, particularly since it's going to be there in the natural environment. And that's my other concern. I know Daniel Atha put this in the Q&A. Um, I've got the privilege of speaking before. He has a chance to say it himself, but I'm a birder. We all know that. And I'm very concerned about the amount of glass on that structure. And I would just like to make sure that, that, that there's no question whatsoever, if you have that much glass, that it's bird safe glass. I know it's required, but I just want to make sure. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, I think other than the Q&A, and there are a number of questions that maybe we'll turn to that in just one minute. I wanted to ask one more question that I forgot to ask myself, and that is um, for the present for the um, panelists. With regard to the, uh, the slide that talks about the waiting list of 850 people, um, persons, and the uh, 15-year waiting list, um, are those, is, is that all for slips, not moorings? And do you have information, I assume you must have it, even if you don't have it tonight, on where those people, the size of those boats, where those people live, whether they are residents of, some of them may well be residents of our district, whether they're residents of New York City, whether their boats are registered in Newport or Panama. What can you tell us about the boats and the people on the 850 uh, person waiting list? So, um, <clears throat> sure, Clary. Yeah, um, yeah, that waiting list has just continued to grow and grow. Um, it now takes 15 years to get a, a birth. Um, so no, we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't maintain all that information. People apply on the park's website. It's a very transparent pro process. Uh, that list is maintained by our legal office. My division does not maintain it. So there's no funny business there. That was one of the first things I did when I came in. I said that should be maintained outside of our division. Um, so it's, 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 as we receive them, it's chronological. And then when someone gets an offer, we call them and, and tell them the constraints of the site. Sometimes they defer, uh, because they've been waiting 15 years. Um, we give them one deferral. They stay on the list for when another slip becomes available. And then we call them again. And if they don't have a boat that fits the marina, say la vie. Um, so that's for slips. Um, but we don't, ask for their, for their boat. We don't base it based on the size of the boat. Um, many of the residents are near you, sure. I mean, many, I see the addresses. There's a ton of people uh, on the Upper West Side who would love to be able to get a slip there. 
Um, they're, they're, we don't discriminate at parks. We, we like, we like our, a diversity of, of people to use our facilities. All right, let's turn to the Q&A. And uh, Clary? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, Ken, when we said we would get back to you. Thank you. Then we'll turn to the Q&A, then we'll do okay. our comments. Ken. Okay, um, just a more general question. Who, who um, is this, do you intend this expanded doc to serve? Um, beyond uh, who it's serving now. Um, you mentioned Sheepshead Bay. Are, are we looking at yachts pulling in? Um, and, and if so, how large of yachts uh, would be using it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could let the engineers speak to what it can accommodate. But on a user base, it'll be the same as what you see now, uh, a diversity of boating, ranges of sizes. Yeah, I mentioned Sheepshead Bay as an example of what it's not gonna be used for. Okay. Sheepshead Bay is charter boats commercial charter boats it won't be used for that so we can't we shouldn't expect yachts like a, that are down at the financial center things like that you'll see yachts there you see yachts there now and uh you'll see small boats yeah you'll see is, a, a full range of boats there is there a maximum size that it sure. can accommodate sure or, and, and tall ships there'll be more space for tall ships educational tall ships that take up a lot of space as well so but yeah, what's the maximum size private uh, vessel that it can accommodate? Pretty big, um, I hope. Well, it's on the, well, the, the slips, if you look at the fingers, uh, it's uh, 50 right now, you know, but on the side ties, if you remember the side tie and then the long um, Western pier, you know, we could tie up a, a, a very large uh, vessel, have the capacity for a very large vessel there. Um, the largest things that were uh, actually designing for, I think it's the sail area of um, some of the higher freeboard, like the Clearwater. Um, but the, if you remember on that uh, one slide, the, the future accommodation was the 50 and 60 foot slips. Those are not in this design. So the whole skew of the marina of the actual slips is, you know, uh, 50 and below. And, um, you know, with the exception of the, you know, you, you can tie up to the T head or you could tie up to the uh, uh, fixed dock. I think the cleats are at uh, 30 feet on, 15 feet on center, I think. So any module of that, it should be usable. But to be clear, it goes to Clary's question as well. We don't select people based on their vessel size either. We try and adjust. We do it equitably based on how long people have waited to get a berth at the slip at the marina. So... Um, you'll find smaller boats and bigger slips often because that's what they have. We, we don't say you can only bring in a 35 foot boat because those are the only slips we have. If someone has a 25 foot boat and all we have are 35 foot slips, they'll get a 35 foot slip. And just Nate, is that true for transients who may just be there for a few days as well as uh, uh, seasonals? Yes, both. So anybody is on the waiting list, whether they want to be there for a couple of days or they want to be there for the season or they want to be there year round. Sorry, for... No, um, transients are as space is available, but it's the same answer. Uh, okay, so the waiting list is for seasonal births. Um, moorings, there's no waiting list for, someone asked that earlier. Uh, moorings are an easy way to kind of grow the field. Um, so as demand uh, ramped up for that service, as we made it a little more um, accessible, uh, we started to drop more moorings. However, you run out of space and it's not a comfortable rest. There's no protection, you're getting hammered. You know, Moses built this thing out in the middle of the Hudson River. It's not a great location for Marina. Um, and the mooring field gets really hammered. Um, so, so sorry, so there's no waiting list for moorings. There's no waiting list for transients. We will get calls and we say, basically it's first come first serve. If people need assurance, we generally say, unfortunately we don't run a business like that. We're not taking payments in advance. It, it's basically as they come uh, similar. And then, and, then, and then to be clear on permits, it's solely based on that waiting list, seasonal permits and year round permits. So I think we are ready to turn to the, take a look at the chat, I mean, excuse me, the Q and A. Clary, I still have a question. Like I said, I'd be happy to wait till after the Q&A. I just had a brief question. Go ahead. Great. Question? So, so one question, and I don't know if this is for Nate or, or for who it is, but uh, it's, it alludes to some of the conversation that Ken has on this, and that is, to what degree are you guys coordinating with the Rotunda work and kind of looking at how that is all being rescheduled? 
and my understanding is that's largely DOT doing that. Is there an active coordination going on in terms of looking at how you guys are, are, are setting this up? Because clearly it's a lot of construction in a small area. That's my question. I don't know, I don't know that's a make. Yes, I mean, uh, so EDC is implementing this project on behalf of parks for the marina and DOT is implementing the Rotunda project on behalf of parks for the Rotunda reconstruction as related to also the bridge repair in the area of um, the road deck. Um, and the two teams are coordinated. Um, like I said, we don't have our construction manager on board yet. So we haven't been delving into the weeds of their construction logistics and they have a head start on us, but we're coordinated from the design perspective now and certainly will be on the, the construction side. And there's ultimately all, you know, in, internal point of contacts in parks that are coordinated on those projects as well, since they're both on behalf of EPR. Okay. And just because it dropped out a little bit, just to clarify, you said you are coordinated together. There is an active coordination, correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah, I mean, to to Ken's point and to my point is there is just this is a, this is the epicenter of sort of our area. There's a tremendous amount going on, and sometimes we don't always see the coordination to the degree that perhaps we would like to see. Or, or so I'm just putting it out there. You know, we would not want to see, for instance, dredging perhaps in our mind should happen in the winter times and not the summer times or the fall times or the spring times. And I understand that certain schedules sometimes overtake it. But I think we're thinking of, uh, of all the pedestrians, of all the kids, of all the bicyclists, everyone, not just one specific group, but there's a large swath of people that use it. So it's going to take coordination to make sure that we just don't wipe out this period of this area for a long period of time. And I just want to make sure that you guys are sort of doing that. And sometimes I think common sense is, hey, well, let's dredge from November to February and there may be a reason not to do that, but I want to make sure that we're trying to look at those things first, because again, there's, there's a tremendous amount, amount of stuff that's going to happen in the next couple of years. And this is widely the, the, you know, for Riverside Park, this is a swath of land that's probably the most popular and there is just so much stuff going in. So again, a, a request just to, just to make sure, but we've got to, we've got to do our best to make this number one, uh, an area that will be usable for, for this period of time, which is going to be five, six years of construction. And number two, that we're all using common sense to the degree that we can. Thank okay. you. The great flag on the coordination. Thank you. Okay. So we have both Q&A stuff and people in the chat. And we typically, at our meetings at least, we do this by calling on people who've raised their hands. But let's see if we can maybe just zip through the Q&A because we really need to move into our discussion of the, of the committee. Um, first, if you, people can look at it, is the Q&A accessible to everybody? First question from Ed Bacon has been answered. Um, so second question, changes to the moorings, I think has been answered. Um, will there be a C, question three from Hugh Savile Deli? Uh, will there be a seawall that will cover slips that are in line with the entrance to the dock, such as V dock? I'm not sure I totally understand that. Does anybody have an answer for that? Steven, I think you can answer this, you know, the point of access yeah. entry near. Yeah, no, the, no seawall, right? Like the, in, um, you know, the seawall is the stone bulkhead seawall supporting the promenade. So we're not, we're doing a little intervention on that as possible. Around the perimeter of the marina is the new wave screen. Right. Of course, it'll be open where the boats come in. The way to attenuate the waves uh, that come through that opening is with the first floating dock, which will be uh, more stout, bigger. And I think to say for those who want to know more about the plans, although we did not get your permission until too late today to post your presentation on our website, we will post it on our website and people can look at it for details. Uh, next question was from Claudia Rosen. Will the engineer's inspection report be made available to the public immediately? Yes or no? That's not my in, uh, inspection report. Nate, I'd defer to you. Yeah. Um, well, I, I checked uh, with this w internally that's subject to FOIL, mm -hmm. Freedom of Information Law. Parks doesn't own the document. It resides at EDC as part of their waterfront inspection program. So that's that document subject. Okay, so the short to answer for Claudia is the FOIL request. 
Next one, is there going to be a ferry stop included and why not? I think the answer to that is no, right? Yeah, there's no intention. Of, okay. um, you know, uh, so then design. again, Ed Bacon, what has changed to make the docks more, to make them more unsafe? They've been in a steady state of repair for over a decade. <laughs> I don't think we can really get into any more detail on that than you guys have already talked about. Um, Daniel Atha, the new boathouse will be elevated with extensive glazing. We've talked about the shorebirds and the glass, and the uh, glass that is now mandated in the um, uh, in building code. So we've covered that. And then anonymous attendee. Excuse me, Kari. We, we, we covered the fact that we wanted it to be included. But is can you answer the question? Is it included in specs? We are, we're not uh, comment noted. No, we're, well, I wouldn't be at that point at this level, but so it's, it's noted that's, yeah, that will not be lost. Yeah, I mean, I yeah. think you guys have said that your architects of record for the building are not your consultants or are different companies. They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're, it's Craig. I've worked with him for 10 years. Yes. He's, they're he's part working. of the design project team. Right there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, okay. I think, I think that that's where, where, where we're coming from, and it's in the code now. So we, we hope that the no problem. We're designing to be fully code compliant. The building. Okay. Uh, next one from anonymous attendee about the residents. Um, that's really a comment. It's not a question. Next anonymous attendee thing is um, engineers report. We've already talked about that. Um, it's can be foiled. Uh, Consideration, next question from Logan Rowell. Is there any consideration for sailing schools and youth sailing programs with the new design? I don't think we talked about that. Anybody have an answer? Do, um, so I'm, I'm sorry, Claire, I couldn't hear you, but um, oh, we, we intend, again, we don't intend to, to change any of the current offerings or add or subtract. If anything, augment the ones that are popular, like our educational programming. Mm -hmm. Nate, Nate, can I uh, piggyback on that comment? Sure. Is actually, um, I'm not sure if everybody saw it in the entirety of Stephen's uh, presentation, but we actually did carve out at the end of one of the fixed, uh, where the, uh, the east-west entrance uh, dock meets the, what, what would we now call the wave wall. We intentionally uh, had them design in a wider platform. Um, and Stephen mentioned that would be specifically kind of designed for uh, educational programs, whether the ones that the dock masters are doing, the ones that the tall ships are doing, and or or the ones that uh, the sailing schools uh, do, but uh, so yeah, there's we would be as welcoming to uh, sailing schools and youth programs as we always have been, and but we're actually specifically designing that wider spot for educational programs. Okay, so then there's a correction by a prior person who's uh, very complimentary, and then I think I know the answer to this, but let's get the answer from you guys. Will the new marina be run by the parks department or a concessionaire? There's no, yeah. yeah, there's no plan. Uh, again, unless they lay me off, it's possible. I, I shouldn't <laughs> joke. Shouldn't joke. Um, there's no plan to concession the site. Uh, if anything, during my tenure, we've found that operating them directly uh, keep them more in the public domain. See Inwood. I kicked out two operators up there. We now operate it directly. Okay. Um, that covers the Q and A. Um, so Polly, I mean, Clary, just to let you know, traditionally, if you don't, you don't have to go through the chat. What we, we, what we've been telling the community members is, they raised their hand, or if they're Q and A, we will answer it. It's optional if you want to do the chat. We also ask some of the uh, panelists to answer it, but in other meetings, you don't have to answer the chat. It's the Q and A that we do say if they take the time to put in, we'll go through. Okay, that's that's new for us, but thank you, Stephen. That has helped, and we've covered that. So I think um, we should not go through the whole chat. Some are mostly it's comments and some of the questions have been covered. Um, if, uh, let me give one second for anybody who is an attendee to raise their, can they raise their hand? Is that possible? Or is that not working? They can raise their hand. So somebody okay. raises their hand. We'll take just a moment for attendees to raise their hands with any important questions. Otherwise we'll go into our discussion. Um, so I don't see any hands. So now it's time for- You do have on. one hand, and oh, I can help you up, but Gloria Weiss raised her hand. Oh, okay, I, but it's not showing on my screen, but great. Let's I'd be happy to facilitate. So I'll make okay. Gloria Weiss uh, a speaker. Sure, great. 
Hi, I'm a resident at the marina for 35 years, and I'm nervous about being displaced for six years possibly, or who knows more. I don't understand why the engineer's report, for the sake of transparency, can't be made public without a FOIL request in building trust and our commitment, the city government is committed to transparency. Why do we have to, the community members have to put in a formal FOIL request? Um, the marina, it continues to be open with sailing classes going on and, and transients coming in this summer. It's hurricane season. I, I want to see the, the engineer's report. Yet we are being told we have to leave our homes in four months. And many of us are senior citizens living here for 35, some 50 years. Okay. So Nathan, I'd like to, yeah. Somebody want to just give some feedback on that? The, the request is, you know, you mentioned it before, but a stronger request uh, for transparency on the, uh, yeah. on, on the request. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, again, I, I don't, I, I can't change the, the the workings of, of city government. So um, I, I forwarded, we got that request a couple of days ago from one of the boaters. I forwarded the exact contact information at EDC to to attain those documents. I'll, I'll be proactive and just say, Gloria, perhaps you know Helen Rosenthal is was on here, and maybe if you want to reach out to her office, perhaps they can help facilitate that in a quicker manner, and maybe that would be a good use of a of a contact. We certainly empathize. Uh, that your, your situation right. we can we can uh you know <laughs> confirm with our project uh legal you know attorney on this as well again it's a contract document and those are just typically subject to foil um you know i can confirm offline as well and just uh let you know that that is indeed the process or if anything can be um you know Julia, that's great. We would appreciate that if you can double check on that and if there's a way to make it public faster and more easily and more generally be foiled by individual requests that we do. Otherwise, people are being foiled. Okay, so I think that was it for um, community people, and now it's time to have a discussion. And um, I actually would like to lead off the discussion um, by saying a couple of things. One is that um, I think I was persuaded by what Ira said to us about what 30% means. Basically, I think this is it. This is going to PDC um, and uh, it is pretty much uh, finished in scope. It was described as final in the uh, press release. And I think this is our chance. So um, I, have, I, I think maybe we might want to do a resolution if we can agree on what it would be. Um, because that's how CD7 speaks and that's how we speak to the PDC. Um, I am not willing to, I think there's much that's great about this, obviously. I mean, I can't speak to the condition, the engineering condition and the need to, uh, to, to send the current river boards away, although we've always tried to support and be, um, be supportive of that very small but important part of our community. Can't speak to a lot of the technical stuff, um, but um, what um, bothers me most about this among a variety, let me just say two things, I think. One is that um, what's in it for us, and by that I mean our community. Our community of people who live in our neighborhood, who are, separate, who are in our district, people who use a park, um, they really have limited use of the marina. It's, it's nice, I suppose, visually to see it. Um, it's important that we have the maximum use of Pier A, the public pier that has been, is the only one open to the public and it's been rebuilt to current standards. Um, but otherwise, what the marina is, is an accommodation for boaters and some of them live in our community, many of them do not. Um, but it's also a revenue, it's, it's a revenue raising uh, a device for the city of New York. Um, it's no accident, I think, that we're hearing this and that these things, the projects being managed by the EDC. So the question is, in my mind, what's in it for our community versus what is what are the negatives for our community? And I want to focus on just one thing quickly, and that is um, 
the public kayaking program. We had a fabulously successful free public kayaking program down at 72nd Street. A pier got broke off. I mean, a piling broke. And that was had to be discontinued a few years ago. Um, I am I do not understand and I do not find believable or acceptable that we cannot get somewhere in this site with the dredging and the permitting that will be done, a site for a small incursion into the river, much smaller than the depth, much less incursion into the river than either of these piers that's being deferred at this point, H and I. I um, for a, ramp, a seasonal ramp and a seasonal dock um, for a free kayaking program to be run by the uh, by DPR in the foreseeable future. On the one hand, and I'm trying to be concise about this, and I'm looking for my note, um, in somewhat cryptic terms, um, both the press release and the um, response to our letter say that there's a new low free board dock for human powered boating, which will be incorporated in the marina. And what I understand that to be at the north end of the marina is a, uh, an access for kayaks of people who privately own their kayaks and put them into the water there. And historically that has been the case too. Um, so on the one hand, we're being told that people can put their, can have their private kayaks and, 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 and maybe uh, canoes and paddle boats or whatever else is human powered. Um, on the other hand, we're told in response to our letter that uh, we can't do a, 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 a space in all of this huge space for a, pre, a free uh, public uh, kayaking program that would be run for by uh, DPR. I don't accept that. I don't really believe it. And I won't, I personally will not support this uh, wholeheartedly um, without that being. Um, part of the design and I would want them to go back and make that part of the design. Obviously much of this is wonderful, making it uh, ADA accessible, putting the utilities in there and, and lots of, lot, and making it lots of wonderful, there are lots of, lots of wonderful things about this design and it's necessary to, to, do, to redo the marina. But I am persuaded that it should be possible in the process of that to give our community something that's worth it to us out of this, to be able to provide the infrastructure uh, for a, a public. Clary, so let me let me cut in. I'm sorry if, if that if I'm speaking oh, out of order. That's, that's that's I right. want to be clear that we we first of all, just to be clear, there was no human powered dock until I got there. We added that yeah. in, in 2003 when I came into the agency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're we're doubling down on that offering. Let's let's be clear. So sorry if if that wasn't clear to you. We're we're making the most direct shoot, 80 foot long gangway, ADA accessible to a pre premier spot in the marina dedicated for human powered boating. This is going to be designed the right way. That other one was on the north side. It had no wave protection. So it's coming inside the marina. We're going to cannibalize some berths and give them the optimal spot for staging their kayaks and launching human powered vessels, ca canoes, stand up paddle boards. So that is part and partial to what I do what Seth do. We've, we've, I've grown the number of kayak launches fourfold during my time here in the city. There were 12. There's now over 45. Uh, we, we are the most adamant supporters of this use of our waterfronts. And we've made sure this marina is designed for that. So be clear, that is free. It's publicly accessible. Yes, people need to own their boats. But when you say design, you're talking about a programmatic request that a volunteer group did to the south. Um, We've talked about that. I, I appreciate the support. We've met with uh, Borough President Brewer. You've been adamant, I, and I mean it sincerely, Clary. We think it's a wonderful program. It's the, the conflicts between an active marina and a bunch of novice kayakers are legion. The complaints we got between the two users, even being 10 blocks to the south, were immense. It's, it's, it's not a great idea. It sounds common sense that, oh, there's boating, let's, let's put a bunch of kayaking program in there. 
we'll continue to work with you on on a launch site in Riverside Park, as we have with with all the elected officials. We should bring that back, and I'll be the first to support it. We helped repair their dock when it got damaged. We recovered it during Hurricane Sandy. I'll continue to lend all my resources and energies toward that. But you don't situate it within a recreational marina. Full stop. Thank, thank you. Do you do not Dave. put novice boaters tooling around uh, a recreational marina. Full stop. It's it's unsafe for me. both parties. I, I don't want to believe this, but I think the important thing you said is for this this thing you built, and I it's great that you did add this starting in 2003. It's for Sorry, excuse me, but I I we need to cut in here because yeah. we are way behind schedule. We have a lot of people who are still waiting to speak. And we, we have to wrap this up at this right. point. So I, I am, I hear what Nate says. I, I am, well, I support a great deal of it. I am not prepared to have a PVC in San Francisco Bay that I vote for. Maria, Clara, you're, you're, you're tough to hear. I'm just letting you know, and I'm getting texts that people can't hear you correctly. So I guess, are we doing a resolution? I know that we, we have to. Yet. We don't know yet. We need to hear other people's discussion about um, what they think about this uh, Stephen. So, so the question is do you want to hear from other people because we now it. we're just on committee members Stephen, and i don't know why i can't be heard because i'm so close and i put my microphone up but i don't um, do you want to hear from committee members if they okay. want to do a resolution and, and what 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 they would want to say that's right okay so committee members if you want to raise your hand or speak the answer is do you guys want to do a resolution or not i don't know how you no. guys get to your consensus and, and, and what would what would be in it? I mean, as I said, I think that this probably is our opportunity based on what Ira said, um, the, 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 the plan is pretty much gonna be set at this stage and the next 70% is largely um, uh, you know, uh, construction bonds. Um, okay, I, I'm gonna help facilitate because I think it's tough. Barbara and then Ken, do you guys wanna speak about uh, I would be in favor of a letter because I think it gives us more of an opportunity to note all of our concerns and all of the things we like about the project. And um, I would go that route. And also we could send it around to the committee members and they would have an opportunity, of course, to factor in on that list. And I think that's the way to go. I don't think we're going to write a, a solid resolution this evening. Barbara, a letter. Um, I mean, is Mark still with us? And, and Stephen, a letter um, from us, from the committee, is not a letter from the board. I, I think that may be a way to go, but it's not a position of the board. Now, I think that these people have said, the applicant has said, they don't need a resolution. They basically need to say to PDC, we appeared, we presented to um, CB7. So, it may be we can do a letter because we don't need a position of the board. Exactly. Why, why, why don't we hear from Ken too? Ken, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think I come down more on a letter. Um, I think we a letter allows us to express our concerns. It's not a it's not a, a board, um, it's not the voice of the board, but it's the voice of our committee's concerns. And we've raised a lot of concerns um, here. And my main concern is that there not be any disruption uh, to the bicycle path, um, uh, given the uh, conflicts with the rotunda. Um, and uh, I would vote against any resolution that didn't include that on it, but that should be part of the letter. Um, and I also, uh, I understand why the kayak can't be in the marina itself, but um, it would be really nice if accommodating that could be part of the project in some way. Um, so, and, and also I guess the question is, would it, if it was a resolution, is it a, a resolution um, to approve uh, unless, or is it a resolu resolution to disapprove uh, unless. <laughs> well, I think, Ken, in part, it, your, your kind of that question is uh, in part an argument, as you said, for a, a letter, um, given that the applicant doesn't need a resolution and that we may not have an agreement on a resolution. I, I, I get the sense, without our having discussed a great deal about the what most of us would think and most of the community would think are very good parts of this project. Um, 
we haven't had much discussion of those and there's much to be said for it, but the concerns we have about it that give us all some pause um, may lead us, as Barbara and you have suggested, to try to do a letter and not a resolution. Is that where we, I mean, that would be fine. We would be finished with this item in a minute or two if we do it that way. Um, other committee members, Susan, Polly, I'm not asking you to speak unless you want to. Uh, well, I concur with what Barbara uh, and Ken said regarding a letter at this point, um, you know, addressing any concerns. Um, I think for me, it's too early to write up a resolution because I don't really have enough background knowledge on this particular project. Okay. Um, I, I concur with what Barbara has said as well. I think we should do a letter. Um, other committees do that, I think be really appropriate at this point. So what we're gonna do, I don't think we have any real disagreement here, is we're gonna have a letter um, which will in some substantial regards uh, echo the letter that we wrote to the agencies um, in January of 2020 following the first presentation. Um, and we should be able to get that out within a few days. When are you scheduled at PDC? Oh, I, but before, Let's get the answer to that, and then Mark has his hand up. When are you scheduled at PDC? Twenty first, twenty fifth, twenty seventh next month of I, July. Yeah, can certainly get a letter to you well before then. Appreciate that. Thank you. Twenty uh, fifth or twenty seventh, Mark Diller, you oh. have your hand up. Yeah, thanks. I, I'm going to concur with the approach of a letter, although it sounds like you're already there, so that's great. Um, if I may, just suggest a couple of things that I would like. Um, I would suggest it would be appropriate to include in that letter. Um, Nate has given us some very uh, pointed and, and determined thoughts about an alternative with respect to the kayak folks. Uh, I want to I want to weigh in as as continuing our board's longstanding support of the kayak. But if there's a better way to do it, let's let's feed that back and make sure that that's in there, but not to rehash the old, but rather to adopt the new. Um, I also wanted to to make sure, and I imagine you will anyway, but but I feel compelled to say that um, our liveaboard community um, at, the, um, at the Boat Basin, even though they're relatively small, they're an important part of our community. Um, and one that we've at Community Board 7 has had the opportunity to get to know over the years. Um, and in getting to know them, you start to realize that it's not the, um, the multimillionaires from the You've Got Mail movie, it's folks uh, that attend our public schools and bake in our bake sales and are a, a core part of our community. So I would love to see us um, uh, advocate in as strong a way as we can, consistent with what's rational, uh, that they be given the opportunity to uh, stay as close together as possible to preserve that community. Uh, I think we've already been told that they will be welcomed back and I, I think we should double down on that as well. Um, and that we should express something in the way of appreciating their contributions to our community. Um, uh, everything else has already been said, but I think that those are important things to emphasize in whatever letter we write. Thanks. Okay, uh, we have a plan. I mean, I think that the letter, much of what was covered or what we talked about in our letter in January of 2020, uh, um, one way or another is kind of resolved. Uh, many of those issues are kind of resolved as much as they're going to be, but there certainly remain unresolved issues, some of that we focused on this evening. So we have a plan. We'll get you a letter. You'll be able to say to PDC that you appeared before um, CB7. I, I do have a concern that we may never have an opportunity to do a resolution should we otherwise want to, because um, basically, because I would explain why. Um, but we have a plan. So with that, um, uh, Clary, I yeah. just want to make sure that the letter will include what Helen brought up. And oh, everybody will see the letter. You'll have every opportunity okay. to comment. Okay. Okay. So just want to along. put that on the record. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Although, can I? Is Helen still with us? Helen Rosenthal. I think not. No, I'm I'm here. Sorry. Oh, no, I, I just so I can be clear because I have a feeling I'm writing this thing. Um, were you talking about widening the Esplanade along the marina for like let's say eight or ten blocks, or were you talking about widening the whole Esplanade from wherever to to all the way? That's a great question. I mean, I think at Seventy Second Street, it comfortably you know 
we don't need anything there. So it would be 72nd Street up to what can 83rd? Is that? Yeah. Yeah, 83rd. All right. So and I guess. I actually, I forget who said it, maybe Ira, this notion that you can put in um, some, some uh, indicators that it's to come, you know? So uh, my, my strong recommendation would be that we would at least do that. And look, if it's something the community board is interested in, I think it's something the community is very interested in. Um, I, I, you know, if I can get a million bucks to put in as a placeholder, I, I'll certainly try this time around. Oh, Helen, a million dollars would buy you nothing on this, on that. Um, gotta start, <laughs> sorry, gotta 80, start 80, million, 80 million here and it's not buying everything they wanted to buy in the water. But um, anyway, we will we'll work with that point. And Helen, if we need to, we'll confer with you further, I think. You know, I can't imagine anybody who wouldn't love to see the Esplanade widened at least at that area where there's so much uh, a variety of traffic going on. So we'll include that. Um, are we done with this item? I'm delighted to turn this over to Barbara for the next item. Um, I guess we are done with this item. Great, thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very, very much. Thank you and for having now, me. <laughs> I, know, I know Barry Kessler, I know you have been here from the get-go. I really apologize for the long wait. Um, is Jim also here or are you here yourself? Jim is, Jim is here. He's not, uh, I don't believe he's as a, uh, um, you know, a panelist. He may have to be shifted over or something. Okay. I haven't if, seen the picture if, or chat with Jim him. Jim Collins is, is here. Could somebody please uh, promote him? So we're going to have a presentation on, excuse me, you did. Okay, great. Uh, we have a presentation on lawn bowling in Central Park by Jim Collins and Barry Kessler. So please take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Barry Kessler, president of the New York Lawn Bowling Club. I'm accompanied tonight by Jim Collins and, and Luis Bosworth, both members of the New York Croquet Club. Uh, thank you for inviting us to speak. Uh, we ask, we're here tonight to ask for your resolution in support of our efforts to restore the Central Park Croquet and Lawn Bone Greens to, as former commissioner of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, Henry Stein once said, make it possible for a precious piece of Central Park to become more open and accessible to lovers of lawn sports. Uh, we prepared a short presentation. And I'll begin to play that, and I hope you uh, hope you enjoy it. It should take less than uh, ten minutes. Thank you. Is my screen shared? Can you see it? Oh, Can you just share your screen? Okay, let me share my screen. Do I share it, or do you guys share it for me? There you go. We we don't have the presentation. Only you have it. So no, that's fine. That's fine. I could share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you see that? Yes, yes we do. Okay, super. <laughs> for inviting us to join you today. We welcome this opportunity to speak with you about lawn sports, specifically lawn bowling and croquet. 2026 will mark the New York Lawn Bowling Club's 100th anniversary in the Mineral Springs section of Central Park, just above Sheep Meadow. Lawn sports in New York City date back to colonial times. In 1626, the same year that Peter Minuet purchased Manhattan Island, Bowling Green was laid out in Lower Manhattan. On March 9, 1733, the New York City Council adopted a resolution providing for the creation of a Bowling Green. In the original 19th century design for Central Park, 
a croquet house was planned at the southern end of the park, but a larger structure was built instead to house equipment for many sports. Bowls arrived in Central Park in 1926 with the founding of the New York Lawn Bowling Club and construction of a new bowling green. A second green added in 1930 is now used by the New York Croquet Club. Lawn sports are enjoyed by millions of people of every age all around the world. Lawn bowls or bowls is a sport in which the objective is to roll biased bowls so that they stop close to a smaller target ball called a jack. Croquet involves hitting wooden balls with a mallet through hoops embedded in a grass playing court. Both games demand a smooth, flat, firm playing lawn surface that emphasizes players' skill and accuracy rather than strength. Under proper conditions, lawn sports provide balanced competition, fitness, and fun for all persons, regardless of age, sex, or disability. For seniors and other physically challenged persons, our games provide an invaluable outlet for improved balance, coordination, and the enhanced well-being that comes in self-esteem, community connectedness, and support. Nearly 30% of Upper West Siders are at least 60 years young. The physically able may enjoy tennis, jogging, or even a leisurely walk. Yet for the physically challenged, there are few recreational options within Central Park. The lawn bowling greens in the park offer an invaluable haven for city's residents of all ages and physical conditions to compete on an equal playing field. Despite this worthy history and all that Central Park's lawn sports have to offer, there are genuine challenges, primarily related to the conditions of the greens. Notwithstanding the continued care the Conservancy provides, the Central Park greens and accompanying lawn sports center facility have fallen into disrepair. The sports center, once a fully dedicated clubhouse, now is divided to share services as a maintenance facility. Moreover, as our pictures will clearly demonstrate, the greens are a mere shadow of their former selves, now inconsistent at best and unplayable at worst. Fifteen years ago, the greens were smooth and playing conditions true. Now, the greens are rough, spotty, unplayable. Without a smooth, level, and firm lawn surface, the nature of play changes dramatically. No longer can the bowler gently lay the bowl on the flattened grass and rely on the arc of the bowl's bias to reach its intended target. Nor can a croquet player trust that her shot will roll true through the wicket as aimed. As players are forced to use strength as opposed to accuracy and acumen, less physically capable persons can no longer play at all. Thick grass affects distance and direction. The unpredictability of a rough surface alters shot direction and hampers the player's balance. The beauty and appeal of the games are lost. And older players are threatened with strained, even torn muscles due to the effort to send the bowl down the green. Throughout the years, the New York Lone Bowling Club and New York Croquet Club have engaged the New York City community by actively demonstrating the fun and benefits of lawn sports. Organizations such as the Achilles Club and the Special Olympics have voiced their support for the rehabilitation of the lawn sports facilities to better serve their constituents. Additionally, 
the vision of a world-class playing surface in Central Park has captured the imagination of national and world sports governing bodies to broadcast world-class tournaments from our iconic location to drive popularity of their sport from beyond the UK, Asia, and Australia to the United States. At the turn of the 1900s, Mineral Springs was a popular family destination. Alongside the greens, there originally stood a rich decorated Moore style pavilion designed by park co-designer Calvert Vaux. Inside the centerpiece was an ornate marble counter with silver faucets dispensing various mineral waters, then thought to provide numerous health benefits. In July of 1869, the Times noted that, quote, thousands of people visit the springs early in the morning for the purpose of drinking the waters and for recreation, end quote. The mid 20th century proved unkind to the pavilion. In 1957, it was demolished and replaced by Robert Moses with an uninspired structure that houses the recently reopened La Pan Quotidian and adjoining Lawn Sports Center. One of Central Park's most delightful architectural gems was lost forever. The centennial celebration of Lawn Sports in Central Park gives us the perfect moment to return Mineral Springs to its glory days. The global media attention from annual televised sports competitions would bring a vital source of revenue for the Parks Department and goodwill to this long neglected section of the park. We ask for the support of this community board to press the New York City Parks Department and Conservancy to return the greens to their original vibrancy. Our objectives are clear. First, to repair our city's greens. Second, to reestablish a firm, playable surface for bowlers and croquet players for the pleasure of the games and safe competition. Third, to create a venue that is worthy of televised events sponsored by world lawn sports organizations so as to bring worldwide attention and revenue to the park. And fourth, to return glory to Mineral Springs as conceived by Olmsted and Vaux, a destination for public refreshment and recreation. These goals are achievable. We can have world-class lawn sports for New Yorkers of every age and ability and a renewed Mineral Springs. Lawn sports have been in Central Park since 1926, the time is now to ensure another century of recreational accessibility. Thank you again for providing us this opportunity to speak. If time permits, we're happy to expound upon our vision of lawn sports in Central Park and answer any questions you may have. Thank you for, for your patience and hope you enjoyed that. Thank you very, very much. I found that really, really interesting. Um, before we take questions, would it be possible for you to send me that presentation? Uh, absolutely. You want me to send it to you right now? That would be great. We'll share it with our committee. Um, questions, people? I, I can't. I, I have a question. Um, I assume that the Central Park Conservancy has no jurisdiction over this area or, or what? Well, yeah, let me speak to that. So we, we deal on a regular basis with the Central Park Conservancy at the maintenance level. So the folks we deal with are concerned with keeping the lawn short and hopefully being able to uh, open the green, uh, hopefully remove standing water, things of that nature, but they're not, uh, they're not really focused or they don't communicate with us anything regarding long planning and uh, and fixing the facilities. And uh, we're, we're in a recurring uh, pattern of 
disrepair. There's only so much maintenance can do uh, in its current state. Um, so we really don't have any dialogue. And we tried uh, for, for many years to speak to them about, um, you know, the opportunity to uh, upgrade facilities uh, and, the op and the revenue opportunity that we have, particularly in light of the current economic conditions. Uh, but we don't get any attention. And really, we hope that bringing this to the community can allow us and give us the opportunity to to get face-to-face uh, -face with the planning people within the Parks Department and the Conservancy. Well, we have a number of people from New York City Parks on this call tonight, so maybe one of them would like to speak to this, but um, I would I would be in favor of writing a resolution for sure, but Ken, why don't you go? Okay, maybe we could get rid of the screen sharing so we can see each other again. Hold on, let me see if I can facilitate that. <coughs> My end, uh, let's see here. Okay, about... That's great. <laughs> um, uh, so um, I, I was just, uh, it seems like you have a, a wish list here of basically three different things. One is the uh, restoration of the green to a playable condition, which seems like the least costly and the easiest to accomplish. Um, and then the um, something called a lawn sports center, which I'm not really sure what that is, but um, well, so I'm, happy, like I'm happy to share that with you. It's, okay. it's a building. It's it's a, it's a building that's accompanied by the LPQ. Pardon my French, so I call it LPQ. It's uh, you know there and serving. It's right uh, north of Sheet Meadow. Uh, and there's, uh, if anybody's been there, particularly on a weekend, the, the uh, comfort stations, bathrooms are totally inadequate. And there's a line, I swear, of about 40 women. It's, it's, it's really, it's really um, embarrassing as far as the city's concerned that we don't have the right facilities to support the overflow of Sheep Meadow. Uh, and, uh, and, and again, as it relates to Mineral Spring, bring back the, uh, you know, the, the glory that it had and was intended to have in its original design, which is lacking today. I don't think anybody, you know, if you ask Moon, many people, they probably don't even know where Mineral Spring is. So the um, modern lawn sports center would be the same as the Min Mineral Springs building that you're talking well, about? Well, Mineral Springs is in is the area. Right. Uh, the uh, the uh, facility that we use in part is we share with the CPC, uh, they use it for storing maintenance equipments and for uh, some locker space. We share it with them. Um, it would be inadequate if we were to host world-class tournaments, bring the best players from around the world. Uh, you know, it would just be an inadequate facility. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a need to upgrade that for, for, for the revenue opportunity as well as obviously for the public and for the public facilities that are lacking. So that's item number two. Is there any other place in New York City where you can do this um, lawn bowling and croquet? No, no, we are the only lawn bowling and croquet facilities in the city. And there's really uh, no other facility for uh, seniors and, and physically challenged to play competitive sports uh, within Central Park. There is, um, there used to be a lawn bowling green in Prospect Park in Brooklyn but that is in, I believe, complete disrepair, hasn't been used for several years. It's a playground now. It was converted to a playground, Jim. Okay, yeah. And so that is no longer active. There are casual croquet, what's called garden croquet, but that's not really on an organized basis in any park in the city that we know of. Thanks. Clary? I was mute. Flurry, did you? Yeah. Sorry. I, okay. Unmuted. So I have a lot of uh, questions and comments about this. I'll try to focus. Um, so um, first of all, in terms of revenue, I do not see and don't support the notion of monetizing our parks to raise revenue. That's just yeah, for I, me. Actually, not if, I could, why we have a park. if I could comment about that for a moment, because I think it's a very germane point. It, the Conservancy has developed a, what I will call a brochure, which outlines their broad five to 10 year um, planning and development. And one of the points that they emphasize in that document is the use of the Central Park for some level of revenue development. 
primarily with film and licensing, et cetera, et cetera. But so that is a component, albeit modest, a modest component of um, their five, 10 year um, plan. So what we're talking about in terms of potential revenue opportunities, and in addition to bringing many, many more people to the Mineral Springs area is kind of consonant with that. That itself may be a controversial um, initiative. Right, Jim, Jim, I would just add to, and Clary, to your point, we are not, we really, our first and foremost uh, desire is really to improve the facilities for the residents of New York City. And any extent that we used it or would be used for, uh, you know, for, for the purpose of tournaments would not be to uh, sell seats and you know bring crowd traffic into Central Park, but rather to televise uh, events and, and limit them to maybe a weekend of the year. Um, lawn sports are very popular, have tremendous uh, coverage in places like Australia and Asia and the UK. Uh, and there's a lot of interest on the parts of, of sports organizations to have a, a single event, televise it, and those, uh, you know, our thoughts is that we could use that to generate in, important, you know, needed revenue. But first and foremost are the residents in New York City, of course. Okay, thanks, both of you. So I'm, I remain very skeptical about this revenue thing and the televising. I think what resonated with me is the notion, is the concern that you documented that this space is in um, a terrible condition. I mean, I remember in the past seeing people use it for bowling and whatever, or if it's not usable and it's a, a defined uh, recreational space within Central Park, I, I think it's a concern that it's not effectively usable. And that's something that should concern us. Um, the third part of it that you talked about is um, uh, the building. Um, I, I can't get behind the idea of, um, and I'm not sure you were suggesting this, um, undoing the concession, uh, re adding to or changing the, uh, the, con the building, which is partly concession, partly sports, uh, DPR, uh, back uh, maintenance and partly some office space for you. I just don't see us asking to have that building modified or altered. Well. Yeah, if I may, let me respond to that. So, well, we're not looking for offices for ourselves. So first, let me say, remove that thought. Uh, the space, again, uh, is inadequate in terms of the facilities it provides, avails to the, the, you know, the level of uh, use that, that Sheet Meadow has. So it's just inappropriate in right. terms of the current stat, status. Uh, what we're suggesting is that, and, and we're not you know, we're not designers, we're not uh, architects ourselves, but uh, an opportunity to work with the Conservancy and the Parks Department to rethink that space um, and uh, to do it in such a way as, uh, you know, to make it more uh, accommodating to the folks, you know, who, all the people that use that area, as well as uh, obviously lend itself to support whatever activities uh, are envisioned, uh, you know, with the lawn sports facility. Okay, my final comment is I am, I find it a mystery, well, not a mystery, but I, I am concerned that we don't know where the Conservancy is and where the Parks Department is on why this lawn is in such bad shape, how much it would cost to restore it, why it hasn't been restored, who would finance it, is it on the list of the Conservancy's capital projects, where, it is, where is it on the list? Um, I, I'm, I'm personally not comfortable with taking any affirmative position without hearing from the Conservancy and the Parks Department. Um, are you able to tell us anything about what they've had to say about the, at least the restoration of the lawn? Right, right. So in their plan, as uh, Jim alluded to, which has uh, made, been made public, it speaks uh, in the next five years, uh, five to 10 years about uh, the restoration of the landscaping in the Whole Springs. It doesn't speak at all to, uh, you know, the playing facilities and playing condition. Um, so uh, with regard to that, uh, when we do have conversations, uh, you know, and Jim can elaborate uh, that we talk about the, the, you know, the facility and the fact that we're not able to play the game as it's truly meant to be. And the fact that we are bringing people in, we're making actively trying to bring community groups into the park. Uh, we've had conversations with Carter Burden Center for Aging and, and the J and trying to bring groups in uh, to actively use it because it's a great facility, particularly for seniors and 
uh, you know, uh, to get exercise and be outdoors. Uh, and it's, it's impossible for us to, to plan and, and operate those type of relationships when uh, there's always some standing water and, and that may cause us to have to uh, cancel uh, planned events uh, or the conditions themselves are uneven. So it, it could create a hazard for those folks that, you know, that we do invite to use the park. Okay, so, so finally from me, the, um, the conservancies, many, many restoration projects in the park are largely but not entirely funded by private donations. They're not always targeted for a particular project, but you know, millions and millions of dollars have been donated. Some are targeted and city funds have gone into many of the projects as well. So is your organization or your organizations prepared to, I mean, do you have a budget? Let's just talk restoration of the law, never mind the building. Great. Do you have dollars for restoration of the lawn, a budget? Do you, are, is, can your organizations raise that money targeted for this restoration? Yes, yeah. as, as, a, as a general kind of for the history, um, I've been involved on behalf of the clubs in discussions with the Conservancy for approximately the last 10 years. And in virtually each one of our annual meetings, which we usually have in the spring before our seasons open, we have, we have always talked about the ability and the desire of the clubs to raise revenue, to sit down with the conservancy and coordinate a redevelopment budget, and that the clubs would, within reason, be able to commit to certain ambitions and certain goals if, we, if the conservancy could develop a, a restoration plan that was reasonable for the facilities, et cetera, et cetera. And ultimately, we have never been taken up on our offer and we make that year after year after year and we have never ever been taken up on that offer just just ever. in general in terms of the overall cost structure uh we have had uh where we have in hand proposals that uh for other greens that have been developed uh and i would say that uh you know if a green cost three hundred thousand dollars and we have two greens um, and uh, that's in a place that's not New York City. So, you know, whether that be two or three or four fold just to build something in New York City within Central Park, uh, you know, maybe looking at 1.5 million to, uh, you know, millions of 1.5 million to rebuild the greens and that would be from ground up if, if that effort were to be taken. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a that's a ballpark figure we would love to uh, and our, 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 you know, Equipped to go further than that and hire appropriate professionals, but it seems to me that it, obviously the Parks Department and Central Park Conservancy are critical. We have to be in partnership with them. So we're not. I, I don't feel right raising money from our own members uh, and reaching out through Kickstarter or other means um, if I don't know that the Parks Department and the Conservancy is on board and collaborating with our efforts. That's what we need right now. Is we need to make sure that we have, uh, you know, a team, a collaborative approach, uh, and, uh, you know, and can develop a plan. Are there any other questions? Yes, this is Michelle Booker. Um, thank you for your time in explaining this really uh, interesting um, physical activity. I didn't know about it and its history. So thank you very much, Barry, for your contribution. You're welcome to join us, all of you. <laughs> Barbara, we do, have, we do have Steve Simon here from DPR. Who uh, I, I didn't want to put him on the spot, but if Steve or somebody else from Parks wants to respond to this, it would, would really be appreciated. I agree. Uh, well, I'm somewhat at a... Uh, uh, at a disadvantage because I'm not uh, I'm not really uh, conversant with this issue. Uh, I, I do remember um, Councilmember Rosenthal uh, office telling me uh, uh, that the uh, groups were uh, lobbying uh, for some funding, and uh, I, I did reach out some months ago to the Conservancy, and I thought that this was uh, I thought this was uh, being uh, taken care of uh, by the Conservancy. So uh, uh, the, the Conservancy really is the uh, uh, the first place to go to to try to get some uh, response on this question. Uh, uh, they're the ones who have primary responsibility at this point for uh, maintaining the uh, uh, the uh, 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 the lawns. Uh, so uh, I would encourage the board to reach out to the conservancy. Okay, Helen, are you still on the call? 
I think not. Yes, I am. I'm sorry, oh, I have a yes. little cold and I'm resting. Um, yes, and I support, uh, very much support um, this use of the space. Um, I think, you know, perhaps one approach could be the parks committee could rank it in next year's um, list of priorities if you if you think it should be on there. Um, I have talked with uh, Steve at Parks about it and I, I support you know <coughs> its existence and and their suggested uh, changes, upgrades, maintenance. I think that the fields are not playable at the moment because they're they're they've been neglected for a really long time. At the very least, they need funding to be able to restore them. Barbara, it seems well, I, to me there's- I, I would like to find out from the Conservancy whether this is a funding issue. So uh, um, I, 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 if you want, I'd be prepared to reach out to them tomorrow. And in, in, our, in, our mo in our most recent conversation with the Conservancy, which occurred in uh, mid-April, uh, prior to the beginning of the season, they, the Conservancy did on multiple occasions note two things. One, the increasing demand that has been placed upon the park given the COVID-19 situation, so that their demand is going up and the revenue is not going up commensurately and in fact is being reduced. So they have very they have mentioned uh, budgetary constraints that they have on their ability to do work. We have again promptly responded by saying we were happy to sit down with you and discuss a joint funding plan that might ameliorate this situation. And we have gotten nowhere with that offer. But, but budget, but they have raised the issue of fairly serious budget constraints. And in fact, in their in their in their five to 10 year planning brochure document, they do talk about very much the need to raise substantial uh, revenue for their endowment to be able to continue um, funding the sorts of initiatives that they have as part of that five and 10 year But, but Jim, Jim, I mean, these conversations have been going on way pre-COVID. Oh, and, absolutely, and, 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 absolutely. Uh, you know, when yep. budget issues weren't necessarily, uh, you know, the top uh, item, you know, top issue of concern. Um, Barbara, we probably should have invited the Conservancy and in retrospect to be at this session tonight. I think we just didn't think about it. Um, well, it, and it sounds like there's a bit of a chicken and an egg problem here with raising money because these guys are saying we'll raise money if we know there's a project and so, but what do we do? Well, first of all, Steve, would you be willing to speak to the Conservancy again on their behalf? Yeah, because uh, when I raised the issue a few months ago, um, I believe I was told that it, it's not a capital budget issue. Uh, my, my specific question back then is, uh, is this something that uh, uh, you, uh, you would want the uh, uh, council member to uh, allocate capital funding for? And I, was, uh, I, I believe the answer I was given was that this was not a capital question. So uh, I, will, I, will, uh, I will check in with them tomorrow to see where this, uh, what, what, uh, what they may have in mind. Steve, yeah. may, may I ask, what, is that, what does that response mean? Does that mean that it's not a money issue or if we had the money, we'd spend it on other things? What does that mean? Well, I mean, it, uh, or is it just a maintenance what, issue? What, what, what I took, I mean, basically uh, uh, there's a capital budget for construction projects and there's, uh, uh, there's the expense budget, uh, which you use for uh, uh, everyday maintenance. maintenance. Right. So I, I took that answer to mean uh, that this was something that they could handle uh, with the uh, expense funding uh, because I was I was asking them whether this was something that required capital funding uh, as a construction project. So they would, I think they told me it, it was not in that category. So, right, I understand that. So, so again, this flies in the face of the comments we get from the folks who cut our lawn through the conservancy. And I, you know, I don't want to get people fighting and fighting and all that stuff. But but clearly there's problems with the uh, with underlying structure and the drainage um, that all the, and, and, and they're great in terms of the fact they do. They do mow the lawn, they do, you know, and with limited funds, they do support us and, and maintain the green as best they can. But at some point you're putting Band-Aids on 
uh, a situation that isn't going to improve. So uh, I guess my question would be what, you know, maybe they don't appreciate the game or the sport. I don't know, but uh, you know, what, how do we, uh, and how can you assist us, if you will, to, you know, to raise this to a level of capital improvement rather than just mere, you know, ongoing maintenance? Well, let me talk to them first. I appreciate that. Thank you. And is the, with, is the committee interested in um, writing a resolution in support of restoration of the of these greens? I don't. I'm not comfortable doing that without having heard from the conservancy and and having the opportunity for Steve Simon, who's now fortunately with us, to get a little more um, information and coordination on this. I mean, I think we could welcome. We could put this back on our agenda, perhaps for September, with with the conservancy and DPR and some cost estimates, cost amounts, and let me know more. Okay. Um, will you come back and visit us again in the near future? And let's hope that we have some resolution to move well, forward uh, and um, get some input. Yeah, I'm ha We're happy to do that. I guess my question is, I, I don't have Steve Simon's, uh, you know, contact details to follow up on on his. Uh, your know, effort. So if there's a way for us to have that, that would be wonderful. And I guess, secondly, uh, part of our efforts really... Steve, if you don't mind, I, may I give them your contact information? Yeah, of course. Thank okay. you. And, I, 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 and actually, Barry, I believe we've been in touch. Uh, we were in touch maybe uh, a year or so ago uh, uh, before the uh, lawns were reopened. Uh, uh, so I, you may already have my email address. Well, uh, I, I don't recall that I do, but uh, but I'm very sad and I would welcome that yeah, again. Barbara, Barbara will give it to you. It's yes, a, thank you. It's I'll, a, I'll email, email you tomorrow with the information, okay? Uh, a, we, we, we would have our hands have up to... and then okay. and then we're going to move on to the next item. So, um, Doug? Well, uh, actually, I'm um, I'm just wanted to point out that I think uh, inadvertently, accidentally, uh, Michelle Booker was not finished. She had a question. And so perhaps you want to take her next. Oh, absolutely. Did you have a question, Michelle? Yes, I did. Um, thank you very much. Um, so my question to, um, it was to Barry specifically, because of the funding issue, did they ever present an amount that they were willing to raise uh, towards this endeavor? And then number two, due to the history of the program, were they looking to expand it so that young people could learn? And um, it's not just, you know, like what are the demographics for, for the sport and were they willing to create an educational component? Thank you. Yeah, no, that's great, great questions. Uh, so they never entertain any type of, uh, you know, uh, discussion around money as, as uh, Jim correctly, you know, stated. We've repeatedly gone and said we, you know, many of our members have, uh, you know, have, have significant funds of their own and are willing to to invest or, or put a part of it into this uh, because they love the sport and the, and the community so much that we have. Um, but uh, we've never gotten any serious discussion. And the folks we deal with uh, are at the maintenance. They're, they're part of maintenance. So they don't talk about anything other than maintenance. Anything that is a capital improvement would be a whole different group of people, I get a sense. And we've never been exposed to that. And, and, and you bring up a great point about education. I'll just give an example. Uh, I think it was uh, in, in May or June, I got a, an email from the Conservancy, as they sent to everybody, that says, uh, here are these wonderful activities in the park. And, you know, you, they have little videos, vignettes to talk about it. And I reached out to our contact person and I said, could we possibly be highlighted, us and the croquet folks be highlighted in an, un, in, in an oncoming you know, presentation? If you give this every month, of course, the best times are to do it in May or June when the season is beginning. It's kind of after the fact if, we're, if you're going to close us in October to talk about it in September. But I said, please let me know who. I, I'm sure you're not the right person, but please direct me to who that would be. And we'd love to work with them and, and, and share one a video of how our sport you know is played and and how much fun it is and and i got no follow-up on that request at all um and uh we uh uh we were entertaining the greensward circle which is a 
young group of people from uh, affiliated that do volunteer service to the conservancy. We entertain them every year with a day in the park. Uh, we have every, I guess they get about 10 to 12 requests every week for free lawn, lawn bowling lessons from, you know, all ages. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just last week, if I may just say this one little story, on one, one, you know, one period we had, had this elderly woman who came to the green, she was closed in, locked in all COVID. She was so excited about playing, getting outside. She really didn't know the sport, but she had a lesson and she was excited. And then she left and a half hour later, I got these two young people who just joined the club. Um, they were in their twenties. And I, I came home and told my wife, this club has so much to offer to everybody. And it's just such a beautiful, um, beautiful thing. Thank you very much. Gary, there is a comment in uh, the chat. Is there, what is the cost estimate for the lawn restoration? Do you know? Well, as I said, I, I have a, a proposal uh, that I got a copy of that was uh, for the uh, Pasadena Lawn Bone Club out in California. Of course, different conditions. And you know, so maybe the way you build greens are different out there. But uh, I'm happy to share that with the board just so they get a sense of what uh, a green redevelopment might look like. Um, and uh, of course, we have two greens. And uh, uh, and then whatever you know impact being in New York has to cost, I, I couldn't speak to, but I'm happy to share that um, with everyone. I'm happy to share the letters of support we've got from our world sports organizations, the Special Olympics, and the Achilles uh, Foundation, and other organizations that support our efforts. All right. So um, last last comment is Ken's, and then we have to move on. Okay. Yeah, I agree that we shouldn't do anything. Um, without hearing uh, the Conservancy's side. Um, but given that it is uh, that time of the year um, when we are doing our expense and uh, capital budgets, we should seriously consider adding this either. I guess it sounds like the expense budget. Um, and uh, give, depending on what the Conservancy's response is. Okay. so. Thank you very, very much for the presentation. Please do email it to me yeah. tomorrow. Um, and yeah, um, and we'll ask. see you again. And we'll stay in touch. Barbara, I just want to add one quick thing on that, which is as we do budget priorities, and it is that season now, makes a huge difference to us if we can put a number on it. Um, it, it I mean, I, I it just doesn't make any sense to me that this would be, that the full restoration or reasonable restoration of the lawn would be a an expense item, which is, I think, defined as under $35,000. Um, sounds, sure sounds to me like it's a capital item, um, but which re regardless of what it was, it is hugely helpful to us and makes a, 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 us far better able to persuade our colleagues in ranking these items if we know the cost. So we're somewhere- And, and I'm, I'm happy to share the proposal again, related to uh, the beach, but Pasadena was one of those two. Um, I appreciate that. Do you have a number you could share with us now? Well, again, it was it was in the range of uh, about three hundred to four hundred thousand dollars for that particular green. But that's not this. Okay, green. thank you. That no, no, no. I mean, it's not New York City. It's that's okay. what it. I think we we need a number, a reasonable number for what it would be to do a reasonable restoration at this site. He said uh, 1.5 million. I said, I said, I would expect it to be somewhere between a million and 1.5 million. But I'm, you know, I, I will bring that back to our club and uh, we'll see what we need to do to make that happen. Well, I, uh, if I could just mention, I think the number really has to, uh, the re uh, number really has to come from the Conservancy. The, the Conservancy would be uh, the one uh, that would be, uh, uh, that would have to actually undertake the project and uh, would have a better sense of, uh, of what things cost. Uh, work that's being done. <clears throat> so uh, it did really, um, with all due respect to uh, Mr. Kessler, I agree. Steve. And without the conversation, and that's a critical part of having that conversation. And, and again, part of the effort, and we went to community board eight, and then we got unanimous approval. They were supportive of our of our effort. We're going to speak to the other community boards as well. But we need to show the, uh, the CPC that the community sees the need as well. So it's kind of a, uh, a mutual effect, if you will. So um, hopefully yeah. the CPC. Okay, we're we're gonna yeah. stop here. At yes, this thank point. you very, very much. Um, thank you very I'm much. Sorry, but we have to we have to keep moving. Thank you. It's after nine o'clock already. So, thanks very very much.
Okay, so um, New York City Parks and Recreation on the proposed design for the renovation of the basketball court at Stahl Bloom Playground. And here to present it, Sarah Reinstein, the landscape architect, John Ernstberger, the Manhattan Deputy Director of Hello. Landscape Architecture, and Steve Simon, the executive, uh, the chief of staff for New York City Parks. Yeah, let, me, let, me, let me just apologize for the fact that this presentation does not have any musical accompaniment. Oh, uh, <laughs> we could play something, make it happen. No, no, I'm sorry, but you know, it's going to pale by comparison uh, to the uh, previous presentation. Ah. But uh, I'm hoping that Town Council <laughs> is uh, still on the call. Uh, this I'm project. here for sure. And I just texted Amber. Oh, very if good. someone sees Amber Bachelor, <laughs> come on, just promote her. Please I saw her name. Okay, Great. so this, this oh, project. This project has been made possible by uh, uh, by Helen's allocation of uh, six hundred thousand dollars in the current year's budget. This is an FY twenty two uh, FY twenty one allocation, and uh, we actually now have a design uh, within that same fiscal year. So uh, uh, I want to pass it on now to Sarah, who is the uh, landscape architect who has been been working on this project. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, so yeah. Thanks to uh, uh, City uh, Council Member Rosenthal's uh, money towards this project, we can now redesign this basketball court. And um, it's located near Central Park West and Columbus Avenue, uh, 91st and 92nd. The main goals are just to reconstruct it. It's uh, initially started out as just replacing time, but we want to have fun with it. And we want to also make sure that we you know, address the drainage issues and add some security lighting. And we want to replace a drinking fountain. So here's the basketball court. You may have seen it in the neighborhood. Um, you know, it's just passing near 92nd Street. Um, it's inside the larger Soul Blue playground. There's no flood hazard issues. There's no sewer issues. Uh, it's near Central Park mostly and near a lot of you know multifamily residential and mixed use. So here's the existing conditions. Um, just as I said, larger play, uh, playground. This MPP multi-purpose area is currently under construction and that's gonna be done way before the construction on the basketball court. So we're just zooming into actually where the work is going to be. And it's really just in this court itself. Um, there is some drainage issues and it's damaged asphalt and some damaged chain link fence. So we wanna repair the chain link fence and of course repair and fix all the asphalt issues and the grading and drainage issues and a new drinking fountain. So when we came to the site and we saw this beautiful mural on uh, the Lillian Weber, Webster Weber School, um, it was just like mind blowing for me. Like it was just like so colorful and it was really bright. And it was just like this beautiful thing to, I don't know, it was just very exciting for me to see that. And um, you'll see in a, in a bit how it inspired my, uh, the project. Um, so there's an outdated water fountain again. We're really trying to work on trying to solve that sooner than later. There's a tree, two trees in the court. Uh, here's the entrance through 91st Street. And this, again, this is the multi-purpose area that's being redone currently. And on the left side here, you can see this is the court with this, uh, the large team of defense. So here's uh, an artist, Irv Toulet, who worked with the students to uh, design and come up with this mural. He had all the students in school. There's this really fun video on the internet. You Google bloom of multiculturalism. There's, um, I, I saw this great video and it and showed how he worked with the students and they all had their, they all had their own little paint brushes out there, like in the school, and they, they painted all these flowers down there, the whole school community. And then he went up with this like crane and, and painted all these fun colors, which essentially it's red, yellow, and blue, which, you know, to me as an artist and designer, it's like, okay, he's basing like, there's a lot of bright colors here. It's the primary colors. And like, how do I, how do I bring that into the ground plane? And um, cause I really like the idea of how he brought everyone together. And it's this idea of multiculturalism. So with that, I proposed some fun colors on the ground plane. And I wanted to bring, you know, the, the, fun, the funness of the wall down into the court. And um, so, you know, that's 
what I got going here. I thought it'd be fun to, to incorporate the colors and also add a little bit of these fun graphics that, you know, maybe kids could create a game or, or play on or, you know, jump around. Uh, besides the graphics itself, we are also looking to uh, lower the fence down to eight feet. Um, also, like I said, add some more, uh, add some parks lighting. Uh, we're going to have new benches and widen tree pits and add some new trash cans. And um, like I said before, also a new uh, bottle filler slash drinking fountain. So here's the fence diagram to help explain that a bit, keeping all these fences, lowering this one fence on the Western side and everything else remains. Here's some 3D um, perspectives that I made to kind of help understand the idea of you could see the colors coming down into the ground plane of it and how it's playing off that with like the linear and, and graphics of the dots and the lines and the same three primary colors. Um, here are some of the site furnishings. And that's, that's it. Um, it's a quick project <laughs> for, you know, to talk about for me, but you know, I, do you have any questions or anything you want to, you want me to go back to or anything? And that, you know, that's, that's what I got. And I was hoping for a resolution tonight so we could bring this to um, Public Design Commission for Friday. This Friday? Yes. No, no, no. We, we can't. We can't do that. We, no, no, can't. No, no. we would be. Uh, you would be submitting it this Friday for a meeting that takes place uh, in July. Is that correct? Yeah, the review is in the following month, so there's plenty of time to get your resolution to them in okay. the the review period. Oh, okay. Sorry, I didn't. I thought I wasn't sure on that. Sorry. No, no. It's, I it's, think I think Sarah, the way it probably works is that you tell them in your submission that you have presented to us, and then before they have their hearing, you get our resolution. Right. Okay. Um. Barbara, I had my hand raised, but maybe I can just say two quick things. One is, Sarah, can you send us uh, to, to Barbara and me or, or through Michelle, either way, your presentation? I think it's the one one set of slides tonight that we did not have in advance and we would have oh, yeah. them. Yeah, we, um, we, we were still working on them today. Yeah. I'll, I'll send it to you. And the second thing I just want to say is I think it's great. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, I'm putting my email in the chat. This is Michelle Booker. Thank you. Okay. For the presentation. Sorry, Ken. Yeah, I think it's great too. Um, I think if you make a shot from that red dot, you should get five points. <laughs> um, but <laughs> um, I, just one question, how long would you expect the, the paint to last? It would be obviously great if it would last forever, but. Well, this is the same paint as our typical color seal coat. Um, it's not any different than what we use. It's just brighter, you know, just more fun colors. So um, yeah, it should hold up for uh, 10 years, I would expect. That's good. Yeah. Well, I have to admit I dropped off the presentation. I missed most of it. So I'm going to have to depend on, on my colleagues, but it sounds like everybody thought it was fantastic. And so do we have a, are we in support of a resolution that is completely in support of this? Barbara, I, I think that we are, but there was a, some kind of thing flashing across the screen of what looked like a question from Daniel Atha, and I'm not sure what happened to it. But um, I can read that aloud. It says, like, he can't use the Q&A, and he wants to, it says, regarding the Saul Bloom playground, the commissioner's grid plan of 1811, produced by John Randall. Actually, why don't we just unmute Daniel Atha and have him talk to himself. Daniel, can you unmute? I've asked him to unmute. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I realize that this is just the basketball court and there's other um, renovation going on in Saul Boom Playground, but perhaps you are not aware that um, the commissioner's grid plan of 1811 uh, produced by John Randell shows a significant pond exactly where the Saul Boom Playground is now. I don't know what year that pond was filled in or are built over, um, but that playground is on a historical pond on the island of Manhattan. And so I have uh, two questions. 
could uh, parks incorporate some sort of recognition of the historical ecology of the site? You've already got the uh, painting plan there, but um, perhaps some fish maybe added to your uh, plan or something like that. And um, question number two, uh, to what extent will native plants be used in the restoration plans? And I have a link there in the chat to the commissioner's grid plan of uh, the map. It's called the Randell Farm map. And I think that's map number 46 or, or 51. And you can see the, the pond very clearly exactly where the playground is now. So you can click on that link there in the chat. So the uh, two questions, historical ecology and uh, native plants. Thank you. Um, I'll try to go with, uh, with that. Well, I would say for, uh, firstly, unfortunately, we don't really have uh, an opportunity to add many plants. We're just expanding the existing tree pit. So if, um, you know, we don't have like plant beds here that we are really, you know, the scope of work here is limited. It's really just a basketball court. So um, even just expanding the tree pits is, is uh, like pushing it in that sense. Uh, we're trying to make the existing trees more healthy by expanding the tree pits. Um, I might speak to the uh, historic context. It sounds like something that we should um, alert uh, our art and antiquities, uh, people who write our historic science text and see if maybe that could be updated to be included. Uh, all of our parks have a historic sign. And, um, it sounds like if it's not mentioned there, it'd be something that would be great to be included so we can uh, reach out to them. Don, uh, that, would, that right. would cover the, the the, the playground as a whole, right? Not, not yes, it fun. does. Yeah, so I mean, that sounds like a creative and thoughtful way to deal with Daniel's comment and informative for the community. I, I certainly would not want to put that as a condition in our resolution of approval, but it's a good way to recognize the form of fun. Great, be nice. Yeah, I, I definitely, I like that idea. And I also think that, um, you know, if we, if we were redesigning a whole playground, that could be something to just consider for the future, like to tie in some historical elements, like for future, you know, when you when we have the opportunity to redo the whole playground and playful elements. So they, that is something that's interesting and worth investigating. Does it include uh, new backboards? The backboards are new currently. Oh, okay. And so it was requested to keep the existing backwards because they're new and, um, you know, why, why fix them that's, that's new? <laughs> they're, they're new and good as they are. So. Okay, I haven't played yeah. there. Okay. Yeah, we, we should mention that uh, uh, the, um, uh, uh, that uh, Amber Bachelor, whom uh, Council Member Rosenthal referred to earlier, is uh, the leader of, uh, of the, the uh, pro uh, maybe the primary user of the court. It's a group called uh, Ladies Who Hoop. And uh, uh, she, she reviewed the plan and uh, she also uh, is in a uh, uh, very strong support of it. That's great. I, I don't know, did, did Amber make it onto the, uh, did yes. she make, did Amber call in? Oh, there she is. Just popped up. <clears throat> okay. Sarah, could you close the presentation now, okay. please? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Amber. Oh, okay, I don't, I don't have to speak for her. She can speak for herself. Oh. Uh, Amber, did you want to comment? Hi, everyone. Yes, um, Sarah and I have spoken about, at length about the plan. I'm, I'm pleased to hear that the board is also as thrilled about the plan as I am. I think it's beautiful. Um, and we're, we're very excited to play on that board. I love that Ken asked about the backboards, um, which we discussed. We were able to, um, through God of Riverside, we were able to get those backboards replaced a couple of years ago. So there's no need to upgrade something that's already been upgraded. Um, so we, we made sure to, to um, inform Parks Department and also um, the, the backboards, the rims, all of the materials and things that we'd like to keep those in there. Barbara, if I may, I have one last question for Steve and maybe for Sarah. So you've, you've got the uh, basketball area that's being, is the subject tonight. You've got the multi-purpose area that's funded and under construction right now. Um, 
do we still have uh, other parts of Saul Bloom that have to stay on our budget priority list, or can we can we graduate it off? No, I, I think um, I think here you. Uh, I mean, we'll just we'll be discussing this in a few weeks. Right. But I think you, I think you want to keep the uh, uh, the uh, play equipment area, the uh, spray shower. I think you want to keep uh, uh, the, the comfort station. I think you want to keep those on the list. I, I think we would still like to be able to do more work at uh, Saul Bloom. Talk about that when we when we talk budget then. Yeah. Okay, so um, our, we will propose a resolution that is completely in favor of restoring the Saul Bloom basketball court. Um, should we take a vote? Um, Barbara, sorry, I had my hand up. Is it okay if I mention a few things? Sure, Helen, go ahead. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> we did do a walkthrough with Amber and all of us are very excited. Um, Amber, are there any outstanding issues or things you wanna see tweaked that the board could take into consideration in their resolution? I'm very happy with the plan the way it is. Um, I love that the board is thinking forward towards the adjacent um, art as well. Um, it was very interesting to hear about the history and I'll just mention that there's a beautiful little um, sprinkler there. And so in terms of fish and the things that we were talking about, that could be a great place to incorporate um, mm. some of the history as well. And um, Sarah and I also talked about, while it is not part of this project, Sarah and I also talked about the park house and how sort of dull it is <laughs> now that the other, the rest of the park is going to look so nice. It would be really nice to do some sort of project to incorporate um, the youth of the community to be able to maybe um, continue in the in the vein of design um, of youth designing and, and being the inspiration for the design of that park. Thank you, Amber. Um, and then Sarah, do you think, um, I know SCA is doing the larger playground, but do you think they could similarly incorporate parts of the design along the wall in their, <clears throat> um, now that they've ripped up the entire playground and they're gonna lay down something new? Um, I know you're different than SCA, but is that something that we could coordinate well, um, I mean, I, I don't know how to coordinate or, you know, with, with them in the sense of like telling them what or how to change their project to match mine, you know what I mean? But yeah. Okay, yeah. so I can, uh, I might do that. So I know Cindy's on the call, we'll shoot over a letter to SCA and see if they can take a look at your design. So when you send your design over to Clary and Barbara, if you could copy our office as well, although we might have a copy. I'd really appreciate that because as you said, Amber, why not extend it? And we have another opportunity to do that with um, the last third of that playground area. So that's really exciting. All right, thank you. Thanks, Helen. Okay, so um, all in favor, committee members only, all in favor. Do you want to um, do, do, do virtual or uh, raise hands or I guess we could raise hands. I guess we could raise hands, either virtually or if you can't do it, just raise your hand. All in favor of the resolution. We have One, five two. committee members here, right? Is that right? One, two, three, four. I've raised my hand. One, two, three, four. I've did it virtually. Who are we missing? Susan. That's all five committee members. Five in, five in favor. Anybody opposed? Any abstentions? Anybody voting not, not able to vote for cause? Okay. Uh, Non-committee members in favor? Non-committee board members. <laughs> Non-committee board members. Mark Diller, Doug Kleiman, Daniela Alvarado, um, Benjamin's not still here, I think. And Paul Fisher. Paul Fisher. Four. Anybody opposed? Abstaining? 
Not eligible to vote? Zero. So it's five in favor, zero, 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 and four non-committee board members in favor, zero, zero, zero. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, fantastic. And now we move on to the last item of the evening. And this is a presentation by the New York Roadrunners uh, to place a medallion in Central Park um, at the finish line of the New York City Marathon in honor of the 50th anniversary of the New York City Marathon. So who is presenting for that? It'll be uh, Owen Strong, um, but uh, uh, let me just mention that um, uh, there's been a slight uh, change in the uh, design oh. uh, since I sent the presentation uh, oh. to, to the board last week. Uh, so Owen is going to be presenting uh, the updated version of, uh, of the design and will show you uh, uh, that the uh, intended location has uh, shifted uh, uh, somewhat. And, they, and the, uh, um, the dimensions of the marker have also changed a little bit. Uh, so, uh, um, uh, uh, can uh, uh, can you allow Owen to uh, uh, share his screen? Or does Absolutely. He... And we we can send you this presentation uh, uh, following the meeting. Yes, that's what we get, Steve, for asking to get a presentation in advance. So yeah, well, yeah, well, that is the danger. And now, it's, now we've, we've... That, that is the danger because very often these uh, presentations are evolving and. Uh, we don't quite uh, finish them off until we get to the meeting. Can, can I just ask one question before we go any further? Is, is Michelle the new district manager? Yes, she is. Oh my gosh. Uh, congratulations. Welcome aboard. Look Thank, forward you. To Thank you very much. Okay. I look forward to working with you in, your new, you in your new capacity. Very good. Great. Um, all right. Owen, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody else. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak with all of you tonight. I'm going to now share my screen uh, and we'll roll through the presentation. Can I just get a little by uh, some nods of heads? Do you guys see it? OK. All right. So New York City Marathon finish line commemoration. So th this project, in essence, uh, so this year is the 50th anniversary of the New York City Marathon. So New York Road Runners is looking to commemorate the previous runnings, this running, and the future legacy of the iconic Central Park finish line by installing a permanent marker near its location. A little bit of history on the finish line itself. Over 1 million marathon finishers from all around the world have seen this site um, and, and passed through it in completing the marathon. Thousands of dedicated staff and volunteers have worked this area and have been a part of it through its its 50 year tenure and in 2008 the united states uh, olympic marathon trials uh, were held uh, using the same finish line as the new york city marathon and the evolution of road racing itself you know from you know a modest 200 people to last year or 2019 i should say you know over 50,000 finishers um the the sport and you know endeavor of road racing and marathon running uh, the, the, this marathon finish line has, has seen all of that. And we're looking to, you know, create a year round engagement opportunity in central park for, you know, New York city based running communities, park goers, visitors, um, and not just for our local community, but people even coming to visit the city that are involved or maybe have run in the marathon itself. So the design, and, and as Steve was saying before, um, I'll point out specifically what the, the new direction that we're going in with it. So we're, we're keeping it made of bronze. Um, it's gonna be a rectangular marker, not circular. Um, so we're not gonna go beyond 16 inches um, for the longest side. The design itself is inspired by the first New York City Marathon finisher medal that all the participants received. Uh, pretty simple and timeless. It's uh, talking with the fabricator, it's gonna be a layered relief design. Um, and they use the you know, state of the art, the best um, you know, finishes for their bronze materials in speaking with <clears throat> different members of the New York City um, you know, parks. They had recommended uh, Masterwork Plax, um, who is we're in uh, contact with to fabricate this, this design. Um, and they've done other uh, bronze markers uh, throughout you know, Central Park previously. So it should keep it pretty 
consistent with the look and aesthetic as some of the other monuments that are there already. And this will be maintained by New York Roadrunners. So I know some of the questions we've had in the past have pertained to who's gonna be responsible for maintaining it once it's installed. And that's something that New York Roadrunners will be responsible and, and take care of. In the location, so we'll, I'll show in the next slide where the actual finish line is, um, but we're looking to put the marker uh, very close to the finish line, uh, adjacent to it. It's in line with, with West 67th Street. It's gonna be on the west side of the drive, um, located on the south south edge of the northern part of the sidewalk. And for Marathon Week, it may not be fully visible, but the, the focus is on year-round visibility for when people go to the park. So here we have the, the fully established and decked out uh, Marathon finish line that's built out the week going into uh, the run on Sunday. The red arrow over here denotes the sidewalk area where the marker uh, will be placed. And then this is just a different different perspective from it. Um, so right around here is the, the entrance towards the tavern on the green circle. Here's the finish line. And then the, the sidewalk over here where we'd like to place the marker um, is in that location. Here's a bit of a close up and just a, a very rough 3D rendering of, of what we anticipate it looking like. Um, approximately drawn to scale, but again, it, it won't exceed 16 inches in, in length. And then we just have a couple other uh, vantage, points, uh, vantage points from southeast facing northwest. So you can see the Tavern Circle. Um, and then just another perspective if you're standing in Tavern Circle uh, facing northeast, you know, in this, this location here into the asphalt. The original um, document that we had sent over to previously had it on the east side and it was uh, in the Belgian blocks, um, which posed some some challenges as opposed to the asphalt, and the it was right up against a light post, um, which wasn't the the best look for it. Uh, so that's why we switched it over to the west side in coordination with uh, PDC's recommendations. But that's pretty much this in a nutshell. Happy to answer any questions that anybody has at this time. Um, I had a question. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you place it where the actual finish line is, right in the middle of the road? So the the biggest obstacle with that is that it could, with the engraving on it, pose um, a tripping hazard for rollerbladers. Um, it could also get hooked on, you know, vehicles or snow plows or anything like that. So that was something we originally floated, but it it proved to have more challenges um both logistical and practical so that's what the direction we we went away from it okay sorry will it be flush with the pavement yes great clary yeah it, it, so i was just confused by the last slide is is uh is it in the pavement on the path or is it in the um curb it's, it's, uh, I can pull it back up real quick. So it's, it's going to be up. What we're proposing is going to be up on the, the curb. Um, so it's not going to be on any part of West drive or the actual roadway going into tavern. Um, but it would be flush in the asphalt up on the, the curb here. It's then in the pedestrian path. Correct. Now not in the curb. So why is it not a tripping issue um, on the pedestrian path if it would be in the roadway? That's more for just walkers rather than rollerbladers or cyclists. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm fine with this. Ken, did you have a question? No, I was going to ask Clary's question, but that's a really old picture you got there. They're cars. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that one was from uh, from Google Maps. I went out and took some uh, this morning, some up, updated photos. So it will yeah. will be getting rendered. Yeah, yeah we don't Google. allow the Google car in there anymore. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> having, having, having run the marathon several times, I, I think it's a little bit sad that, that it's not going to be at the finish line in the middle of the road there and that 
yeah. it wasn't some way to make it smooth because it's it lo loses its import to be over on the side as far as I'm concerned. Although I will certainly support it. So, thank you. Doug. Unless anybody else has anything else to say, Barbara, it sounds like we should oh, do a simple resolution here. It is, is there somebody else who wants to move? Doug has his hand raised. Just, uh, I, I know you said that it's a, re a, a relief. And you also said it's flush. So I mean, I'm sure that the relief is de minimis. But what what is the differential? Um, I mean, we're we're still working on that with the the fabricator itself. But probably, you know, I'm gonna guess like an eighth of an inch. You know, around there. It's more to just differentiate the the heights. For it's it. We don't want it protruding. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a resolution proposed in favor of this um, memorial, this medallion that's going to be on the side on the pedestrian path of Central Park near the finish line. Um, take a vote, committee members only, all in favor. Oh, my hand is raised already. Oh. All opposed? Wait a minute, sorry. We have four in favor? Who's missing? Or is, is anybody missing? Susan. Anybody opposed? Any abstentions? Susan, okay. And non-voting for cause? Zero. Okay, non-committee board members in favor? I don't know Our, why my hand is still up there. Doug, is Paul uh, still with us? Uh, Daniela, that's three. Is Paul uh, Fisher still with us? I think not. Anybody? So was, Barbara, that looks like three. Is that right? Three. Anybody opposed? Zero. Any abstentions? I'm voting for cause. Zero. So it's four zero one zero committee members and three zero 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 non-committee board members. So. When will this happen? We're, I mean, the longest we want, you know, the, the end goal is by this year's marathon, um, which is which is in November, but we're we're moving as fast as we can with it based off of where we're right now. I'd say looking more towards end of summer, early fall. Um, but the having it in the ground for the the fiftieth running of the, the marathon is is the, the end goal. Is is this year coming up actually fifty or was last year fifty? Because you didn't run it last year. Correct. So it's the fiftieth running. It's uh as opposed to the fiftieth anniversary since the first year the race was incepted. Right. All right, great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, that's that's great. Um hey, Barbara, I thought I thought last year's race was the one that you ran. <laughs> yeah, that was Rosie Ruiz last year. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Barbara, how, how many did you actually run? Three. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. That's <laughs> a while ago. It wasn't last year. Uh, oh, oh, and uh, when, when we install this uh, marker, let's make sure uh, Barbara gets invited. She should be there. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I do believe we would like to do some kind of unveiling. So happy to share it with any of the community boards if they would like to attend. Or okay, but among all the community board members, she has to get the first invitation. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, Barbara, um, we're finished with our uh, listed agenda, finally. And um, we're certainly not going to take time for updates on our many, many, um, our many uh, initiatives. But I, I think there's just one thing I want to mention quickly because it goes with Daniel Atha wanted to tell us something that relates to the Rotunda Project. Um, nobody's telling us anything about the Rotunda Project. The, the, the vote basin people seem to assume it was already happening and, and they seem to know, but I'm not sure they really did know any more than we know, which is nothing about when it's going to happen. But uh, that's my lead into Daniel Atha. I, we told him earlier today that he had a, something he wanted to tell us about that. So Daniel, if, if you, you are still with us, if you want to just tell us that. I see Daniel still with us. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak about that. Um, on the wall of the rotunda, there is a rare fern. 
It's called the purple stemmed cliff break. And it's only known from a handful of locations in all of New York City. And there's a significant population growing on the vertical wall there of the rotunda. So I would hope that the in the reconstruction process that somehow the preservation of that plant can be taken into account. Either they're moved and, and put back or somehow um, accommodated so that they could continue to exist on mm. the site. Thank you. Daniel, as I said, we are unfortunately totally out of the loop on the rotunda now. The design was finished and we don't know when it's going to start, but I believe they have, is Steve Simon still with us? Maybe not. I thought there was a dedicated um, uh, email address for the rotunda project within DOT um, because it would be, you should probably communicate that thought directly to those folks. Okay, I'll get that email address from Steve and I'll send him an email about the plant. In yeah. any case, Clary, I would imagine they'd come back to, to us before they move forward with any kind of project. So, well, you know, the final plan the for, uh, that. were approved by the whoever. I think, I think they have a contract. We've been unable to get any more information, but I think you're, um, you're a little optimistic in expecting them to come back to us, Barbara. They should. Oh, my naive day, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I've been, any day I've been expecting to find the ball fields closed and the bulldozers there, but um, it would be nice if they told us before it happens. Mark is here. Do you have a question? Uh, Mark Diller is oh, here. It must have been left over from voting, sorry. Oh, okay. Okay, then I think this is the end of our meeting, right? Yes. Okay, okay, fantastic. Okay, okay, so. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. Till next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.